to this, the first meeting of the Public Petitions Committee in 2017 and wish you all a belated um, but very genuinely happy New Year. Um, and can I remind members and others in the room to switch phones and other devices to silent. Agenda item one is a decision on taking business in private. The first item today relates to our future consideration of a draft report on petition PE1463 on effective thyroid and adrenal testing, diagnosis and treatment. Do members agree that our consideration of the draft report on this petition be taken in private at future meetings? Is that agreed? Thank you. We can now move to agenda item number two, um, current petitions. Petition 1458 on the register of interest for members of Scotland's judiciary. Our second agenda item is evidence on petition 1458 from Professor Alan Patterson. As members will recall, the petitioner suggested that the committee may wish to invite oral evidence from Professor Patterson, and he has agreed to appear um, this morning. Um, and I'd like to welcome you to the meeting. We appreciate your attendance. I wonder if you'd like to make any opening comments, um, and if so, I um, invite you to do so for up to about five minutes. And after that, we can take questions from members. Well, uh, thank you, uh, uh, convener. Um, I, um, I'm happy to answer any questions that I can uh, to the committee on this topic. Um, in terms of a preliminary statement, uh, I would say that um, I see uh, the issue of uh, a, a register of interests uh, for the judiciary in Scotland as an important issue, but an issue on which, as I said in my written evidence, I haven't reached a concluded uh, opinion on. Uh, where I have expressed an opinion is in relation to the Supreme Court, uh, where I think that uh, the balance probably tips, in my view, towards there being uh, uh, a need for a register of interests. Uh, and I've explained why I think that in, in my written evidence and uh, in, in the lecture that I gave, the Hamlin lecture, uh, where I said that. Uh, for me, the question of register interest uh, comes back to the role of the judiciary in a, a democracy. It's a branch of government or the state, and in a democracy we expect uh, uh, wielders of state power to have a form of accountability. But it's very important in relation to the judiciary in a democracy that they are also independent, and judicial independence is a vital part of any democracy. So you have to balance these two uh, issues, uh, judicial independence and accountability. So issues such as recusal or uh, criticism of judges, discipline of judges, complaints against judges, or a, a register of interests are all areas where we try to draw the balance between accountability and independence. Thanks very much for that. Do you think there's a third factor, which is just simply transparency, that doesn't, is not in conflict with independence, but just kind of, you know, basic standards of reasonable expectations that, of, of openness? I think transparency for me is part of accountability. Um, well, in terms of accountability and judges, we, the prime things we require are the judges give uh, reasons for their decisions um, and that we um, expect them to identify who the judges are who are making the decisions, generally speaking. Uh, that's part of transparency. Uh, so the question of a register of interest is all part of the issue of transparency. Okay, and do you have a particular view on what types of information should be included in a register of pecuniary or other interests, even in, in, in the terms that you've... Well, if you're going to have a register of interest, as I've said, I have, don't have a concluded view on that as far as the, the um, Scottish uh, courts are concerned. But as far as the Supreme Court is concerned, um, uh, we have the example of the American Supreme Court, uh, which some might say is... is, is slightly more political a court than some of our courts, um, but nonetheless uh, they have to have a register of interests and they have to declare their financial interests, their, their show, shareholdings, their hospitality, what gifts they get, what tickets to uh, American football matches they get, and all sorts of things uh, have to be declared, and uh, membership of golf clubs and so on. And uh, they uh, also, at the start of their career as a Supreme Court, have to sign up a detailed account of what 
clubs they're members of, what trustees they're member of, and whether they're masons and all those issues. Um, and uh, the system worked. Um, uh, it, uh, uh, from time to time, it throws up issues, but um, it, it, it can work. Now, in the House of Lords, when it was the precursor to the Supreme Court, because the, the Supreme Court uh, started in 2009, but before that, the, it was the um, judges in the House of Lords that were the Supreme Court, uh, they had a register of interests. Um, and the judges who were members of the House of Lords then became Supreme Court judges, for example, Lord Craig of, uh, or Lord Hope of Craighead. Uh, now that he's gone back to the House of Lords, he has a register of interests, and you can look it up on the website and you can see what his interests are. But when he was on the Supreme Court, you couldn't. Um, and uh, for me, I, I think uh, the Supreme Court has been very good at transparency, rightly so, much better generally at transparency than the House of Lords was, much more open, uh, the whole, all the proceedings are televised, when the Brexit judgment comes down on Tuesday we'll be able to see it, you'll be able to watch the, everything happening, but they just don't have a register of interest, but they had before, and when, if they go back to the House of Lords, some of them, they'll have it again. So. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Maurice Corey? Yes. Um, good morning, Professor uh, Patterson. Uh, one of the issues that have been raised in previous evidence is that whether um, a register would capture the circumstances in which a conflict uh, would mean that it would not be appropriate for a judge to hear a case could arise. Uh, for example, a judge may only become aware of a conflict at the point of seeing a witness list uh, and identifying a social relationship with a witness. Could I ask you of any views on that? Well, the judicial oath and uh, the judicial code of conduct, uh, which are very important in Scotland, uh, means that if you know you've got a, an interest, i.e. a relative is going to appear before you, um, then uh, it, uh, at least if there are parties uh, in the case, you'll be expected to step down. Um, but occasionally, it, a register of interest, if you had one, at its highest, would identify some conflicts which would either remind you or alert others to the fact that you have a potential interest. Not so much necessarily on relatives, but one of the curiosities about the American Supreme Court is about once or twice a year, the justices, including the Chief Justice, uh, overlook a shareholding that they have and a corporation in which these shares uh, are in um, comes up in a litigation and they get involved in the litigation and then they, somebody suddenly remembers, oh, you've got shareholdings in, in that. And, and it's not venal, it's not um, deliberate, uh, there's no attempt at bias. It's, oh, they made a mistake, they overlooked it. So the strength of a judicial register is it allows fair-minded, independent, external observers to say, haven't you got a potential interest here and, and the matter can be aired before the, the case starts? If you don't have a judicial register of interest, then it's all left to the judge and the judge's memory. And even at the American Supreme Court level, occasionally the judicial memory fails. Not very often. All right. OK. Thank you. Thank you, uh, good morning, Professor Patterson. Um, I wonder if you could expand a wee bit on examples of judicial officers holding, um, registering their interests in connection with other roles. Um, the petitioners noted this in connection with the board of the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service, and you mentioned the, the Supreme Court. Um, are you aware of any issues that have arisen for these uh, office holders in being able to hear cases in connection with, with their registered interests? I mean, uh, what precedents are there in, in, that, in that field that you know of? I'm not sure I have an answer to that question. Um, I'm not sure what the petitioner was getting at. Do, do you know? Could you elaborate a little more about what was troubling him? Because nothing immediately springs to mind. But. Well, I think he just raised the whole, the whole, the whole subject of the, you know, the connection um, you know, with the, the board of the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service. And um, you know, you've mentioned the, the, 
the similarity between the, the Supreme Court and former law lords. So really just trying to tease out what, you know, what issues could arise from that, in your opinion. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm apologising for being unhelpful. I, I, I'm, nothing immediately is, 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 springing, is, to is, is springing to mind okay. about that. No, that's fine, that's um, fine. It's just if you were able to, to, to tease no, out a bit further. I mean, Thank you. Okay. Uh, Brian Pertum. Uh, good morning, uh, Professor Patterson. Um, a former judicial complaints reviewer commented on the possible implications of the publication of recital information in respect of possible conflicts of interest only becoming apparent after a case had been heard. Her view was that a register of interest could avert complaints by enabling any perceived conflict conflicts to be addressed before or at the time when a case is heard. Can you perhaps uh, elaborate on that and maybe give us your views? Well, <clears throat> let me go back to the House of Lords Supreme Court. One of the reasons that I raise an eyebrow at the stance of uh, the Supreme Court on this is that one of their shakiest moments uh, was the General Pinochet affair. Uh, General Pinochet came to uh, the UK for medical treatment and uh, a Spanish judge using uh, appropriate uh, international um, processes arranged for him to be arrested for alleged uh, crimes in um, uh, the Junta in Chile. And his case went up to the House of Lords. And at relatively short notice, the membership of the panel that was going to hear the case had to change. And Lord Hoffman was brought in as the next most senior uh, judge. Lord Hoffman's wife, I understand it, worked for Amnesty uh, International in a, in a capacity. Uh, and that, we think, was known about by the uh, senior law lord when organising the panel. But it was all done with some haste. And it's not at all clear um, that they were aware, and they say they were not aware, that Lord Hoffman himself uh, acted on a committee that raised funds for Amnesty International. Now, why was Amnesty International uh, 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 relevant here? Well, Amnesty International has views about torture, and, 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 and uh, it had asked to become uh, an intervener uh, on the House of Lords, and it was the very first case in which an intervener had been allowed. Um, so they weren't technically a party, but they were allowed to address the court on uh, issues to do with torture and uh, what had happened in Chile, perhaps. And so um, Lord Hoffman did not declare that he chaired a committee that raised funds for Amnesty International, although, uh, as I understand it, his wife's uh, position in working for uh, Amnesty International was known to the authorities. Anyway... Uh, the case went ahead, the vote went 3-2 against General Pinochet, uh, and um, uh, with Lord Hoffman in the majority of the 3-2. Uh, a little while later, uh, General Pinochet's uh, lawyers discovered that Lord Hoffman had this interest and not declared it, and um, therefore asked for a rehearing. It had never happened before. And they got a rehearing, and the court was very strong in saying that Lord Hoffman should have declared this interest. And indeed, as I read it, even if he had declared the interest, the parties could not have waived it. It was an automatic disqualification. Which I, I'm not. Anyway, that's the line they took. They then had to convene another court to rehear the whole case. This involved a lot of time, a lot of concern, a lot of bad publicity for uh, Britain and for the House of Lords. And relations amongst the, just, the judges in the House of Lords thereafter were quite strained for a number of years. Uh, so that one failure to declare an interest um, had a very substantial impact on a whole variety of issues. And I've never quite understood why the Supreme Court, knowing that lesson, which was, you know, hardly 10 years old by the time it was set up, did not decide that they should have a register of interest. Um, you can have a debate about whether the register of interest would have caught um, the uh, chairmanship of the committee, but I think it would certainly, under the rules that the House of Lords now operates. And if you want to see 
a possible model, it's not a entirely appropriate model, but if you want to look at a possible model of what a register of pecuniary interests would look like, you can look on the website of the House of Lords, uh, where it has a very detailed uh, series of uh, 12 headings under which you can record things. Not, not all are appropriate for, for judges, but some of them certainly are. I think the second point about Lord Hoffman's interesting, that it was, it was actually his own involvement, but a spouse is occupation with that wouldn't go in a register would it possibly not but as i understand it that wasn't uh, the, that was known about okay. yes that wasn't the issue uh, that's my understanding okay. case. that's very helpful thank you uh, angus macdonald okay thanks uh, convener good morning professor patterson you, the, the example that you've just given uh, backs up your your suggestion in your written submission uh, that the decision on recusals should not be taken by the judge who has been challenged um, I wonder if you could maybe expand a little more on that. Well, again, that's an area where I haven't got a fully formed mind, but what I would say is that I think that as far as um, appellate courts are concerned, I think, like the author, Grant Hammond, who has written the classic or the standard work on judicial recusal, uh, I take the view that on appellate courts there would be an argument for saying that if one member of an appellate court is challenged, um, that he or she should not be the one that uh, makes the decision. Um, but that may be the Council of Perfection, and when it comes to the sheriff in, um, uh, you know, a rural part of Scotland, it, it, it would beyond perhaps quite impractical to suggest that another person makes that decision. So, uh, as I say, I don't have a, a concluded view on it. I can see the case for it, and it's easier at the appellate level. And I think there have been examples where courts have, when challenged on a particular interest, uh, excluded that interest from the body deciding uh, that interest. And I can see the argument for it. But there are issues of practicality to be borne in mind. OK, um, staying with the issue of, of recusals, could I throw a, a hypothetical example at you? Um, say, for example, the, the son of a judge is the litigation solicitor for a defendant uh, in a case at, say, the court of session. However, the judge fails to recuse himself uh, and fails to highlight the family connection to all interested parties. Uh, clearly, a situation like that could be avoided if the decision on the recusal hadn't been taken by the judge himself, uh, the judge who is presiding over the hearing. Um, clearly, you know, we would look to avoid any situation like that, and uh, the register would help. It might. Uh, it, it would be the High Court, I think, if it was a criminal defendant. Um, uh, but I, th I think the... Uh, um it would be known, generally speaking, to the parties. In, in, in the past, it was not unknown for uh, 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 an advocate who was a relative son, daughter of a judge to appear before that judge. In a small country like Scotland, uh, it, it, it's a bit tough to say that can't happen, but um, it used to happen. And, you know, it, as long as everybody knows about it and it's declared, uh, it's not an automatic disqualification. And uh, usually speaking, in those situations, the, the parties would all know, and, and, and no comment would be, uh, no, no uh, objection would be made. It's okay, thank you. Um, Maurice Corey. Thank you, um, Professor Patterson. What consideration have you given to the potential for additional costs or delays to cases being heard if the recusal system were to be developed in this way? Well, that's one of the things, you're, you're right. That's why I, I raised the practicality issues. Um, recusal is one of these areas where you have to draw a, a, an appropriate balance between transparency, accountability and independence. And um, there is a risk that, I mean, with recusal, uh, we, we have a register of how often judges are recusing themselves, but as I've pointed out, we don't know how often they're not refusing themselves, so we can't form a view as to, is that the exact, you know, uh, uh, have they always got it right? Are there situations where maybe they, they didn't get it right? Because the test to be applied is whether the uh, 
fair-minded, fully informed, independent uh, observer would think there's a possibility of bias. It's not whether the judge thinks there's a possibility of bias. It's a question of whether an independent, fair-minded, uh, reasonable observer, probably a layperson, would think that there's a possibility the tribunal might be biased. And therefore, it's possible for a judge to take one view and, and, and an independent position might take a different one. But uh, um, I don't... Uh, that's why we... Uh, Recusal is, is, is an issue that, that we have to look hard at. Um, do I think a register of interest, uh, certainly at the appellate level, would lead to massive uh, numbers of, of challenges that could lead to real problems? If one introduced the system whereby um, somebody else had to decide that, I think it might. So that, uh, I, th I think, as I've said, I think practical considerations may make uh, my council of perfection about in the ideal world somebody else would make the decision unrealistic I think it's more possible at the appellate level Can I check and I also further sort of supplementary to that uh, are there any examples you're aware of serious examples where, where this sort of judiciary abusal um, has actually um, been a, a real cause for a problem uh, which would then necessitate this going forward to be set up well, the, the Hoffman case is, 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 a, is a standard case of what, what went wrong. Um, no, it's not a... Um, uh, it, 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 um, there are, from time to time, challenges to the courts which, are, um, which receive a degree of publicity. Um, um, and... Uh, I'm not aware of any uh, that were as, as um, significant as that particular one. Other questions? <coughs> no. Um, can I thank you for that? Then I, we need to look at what we would now suggest as a committee. We might want to um, thank you for your evidence. I think that's been very helpful and and very balanced, I think. It's been really quite an interesting insight into the issues. Um, I don't know if the committee has a view on what we might do further. Angus? Uh, yeah, I think, um, convener, given the evidence we've heard uh, this morning, we need a, a further response from the Lord President, uh, Lord Carloway. Mm -hmm. uh, I, for one, would like to hear his views on today's evidence, whether that be by letter or, or in person. Uh, I'm particularly keen to hear the Lord President's view on whether the decision on recusal should not be taken by the judge who has been challenged or who has the the, 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 the specific interest that's been challenged. So um, it, it certainly adds another uh, suggestion into the pot that uh, is well worth looking at. Okay, and we can, we can look at how that response is, is given yeah. the most convenience. We don't want to create that's, that's right. unnecessary that's inconvenience. Good. We're not just going back to the previous question mm -hmm. where we're going back with something new. Okay. Mm -hmm. Anything else that we might yeah, do? Yes, happy with Not happy with that. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. There's also um, a suggestion that we um, ask the Judicial Complaints Reviewer for her view on, on any uh, evidence that might have been given today. I think that's that's also... I think we should go down that route as well. Okay. Well, if that's agreed, I think there's a number of actions yeah. yes. there. Yes. OK. Thanks very much. And again, can thank you very much, Professor Patterson, for uh, coming along today. It's been very helpful. Thank you. And can I suspend the meeting just for a couple of minutes till we change over?
bring him back to order. Um, can I just say that we're going to slightly change the um, um, agenda order here, with your permission, because um, some witnesses have been stuck in, in traffic this morning, ironically, when we're going to be discussing tra transport later. So my pro proposal just now, in order to make sure that, if we can, we will hear from the witnesses who have um, been agreed to come, we will go to the continuing um, items at Agenda 4, um, since these do not involve uh, evidence from witnesses, but just, you know, we're going to look at these as a committee. So, um, we're going to look at the first one, which is Petition 1548, National Guidance on Restraint and Seclusion in Schools. The first, so, this continued petition for consideration is Petition 1548 by Beth Morrison on National Guidance on Restraint and Seclusion in Schools. Our papers include a note by the clerk and the submissions received from the Scottish Government, Dr Brodie Patterson and the petitioner. The Scottish Government's submission indicates that it intends to publish its guidance as soon as possible. But in her submission, the petitioner highlights concerns that she has about the guidance. She also raised some concerns about the Scottish Government's response to the UNCRC's concluding observations and recommendations, particularly with regard to abolishing isolation rooms. And I wonder if it, members have any views or suggestions on what action to take. I, mean, I think the, the response from the petitioner is very substantial. I think it's quite challenging. The idea that you would simply redefine what isolation was in order to deal with the question rather than address the, the, what's at the core of the petition, I think it's a concern. Well, I mean, I think we can definitely need an update um, on the the publication and you know the the toolkit and and just you know to see where we are with that at this stage. Um, I mean I think it's a it's a sufficiently um, important and serious issue that we, we should invite the deputy first minister to yeah, give that. us evidence. I certainly think that would be useful because it seems my sense was the petition was going very well that the petitioner felt that she'd. Been, you know, had, had a good hearing from the Scottish Government, from the Deputy First Minister in particular. But there's a suggestion that perhaps now what's been suggested doesn't match up to that. And I think it'd be really important for the Deputy First Minister himself to be able to clarify so. and uh, allay some of the concern with the cynicism, I think, around some of this, that it's, you know, how do we manage our um, obligations to, under the, the Charter? Is it simply almost semantics that's been played with, and I'm sure that would not be the first Deputy First Minister's intention. I think it would be useful to hear from him in that regard. Um, and is there anything else that we should be, that we could do? I think in particular, Chair, I may say the Deputy First Minister is obviously looking at schools at the moment in a big way, so I think it's an opportune time to to have him in front of us and and, and uh, speak about this subject, because I don't know that will be probably encompassed in some of the stuff he's doing. Yeah. I mean, as much as anything else, even just to, to clarify whether the, you know, Dr. Patterson has not misread, but 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 taken their own nuance from from the the response from the government, so it would it would give the deputy first minister a chance to, to clarify that. But I think it is a question of confidence, with, and, and again, I can say in the petitioner suggestion that if you don't have robust guidance, local authorities will, you know, do their own thing, and then of course, in in most respects, that will be. They will also seek to be act in the interest of the child, but it's a very distinct area that I think we probably do want some reassurance on, because of the, the combination of our concerns about um, what happens to young people in these circumstances in school, but also the obligations under the Charter. Yeah. So if that's agreed, then we will um, seek an update on publication and use of the communication passport and the toolkit to practitioners, as Rona suggested, and to invite the Deputy First Minister to provide oral evidence at a future meeting with a view to establishing what aspects of the draft guidance will fall to the Scottish Government and what will be devolved to local authorities to develop their own policies and to address this question of um, actually what, what have the changes in guidance been. Is that agreed? OK, thank you very much. If we move on then to um, petition 1551 on the mandatory reporting of child abuse. This petition is by Scott Patterson on mandatory reporting of child abuse. Members will recall that at our previous consideration of this petition, we agreed to write to the UK government for indication of the timescale for publication of its report on its consultation on reporting and acting on child abuse and neglect. We also agreed to ask the Scottish government how it plans to engage with the UK government on this issue. 
Unfortunately, there was no response from the UK government forthcoming, though the Scottish government's letter indicated that it might be sometime in early 2017. Members will have seen the petitioner's subsequent response. I wonder if members have any views on what action we might take. To chair to the Scottish government and, and get this information out of the UK government. I also, I don't know if the, how the committee feels about this. I think there's an issue about if the UK government is not going to act, it's still within the remit of the Scottish government to act. And at what point do they stop? I can see the logic of waiting for the UK government if they're not going to act. And at what steps would the Scottish government take to address this question themselves? I think it would be useful. It's a devolved issue as well, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that seems reasonable then. Yeah. I, think. I, 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 I mean, I, I would like to, to hear from the UK government, quite frankly. but uh, I, I, I think the issue was that they were going to take some action which would then allow the Scottish Government to kind of fall in with that and work together. I don't think it is that it's, it isn't, in my understanding, it's not a reserved matter, but that, that was a kind of a practical way forward. I think if, that, if, if that's not happening, then I do think it's reasonable to the Scottish Government, well, what would you be doing instead? Because I think the issues, there are difficult issues here about um, if, the, or, you know, if there was that kind of uh, mandatory um, approach, but I do think it's a, the petitioner's question, the whole issue is still one that needs to be addressed. It can't be stalled because it's waiting for somebody to act. So I think if we can agree that we would write the Scottish Government um, to find out what their position is and you know, in light of what we've said, if, if, the, if there's not going to be movement at UK level, what can the Scottish Government do? Yeah. If that's agreed. Yeah, OK, great. thank you. Um, okay. yeah. um, if we can now move to petition 1596, In Care Survivor Service Scotland. This petition is by Paul Anderson on the In Care Survivor Service Scotland. The Scottish Government has provided an update on the rollout and access criteria to the new Survivor Support Fund. The petitioner has since provided a submission outlining its concerns around the loss of trust that has been established over a period of time between service users and counsellors, the potential loss of specialist skills and cost effectiveness. Um, and I have to say that as a, I should maybe declare an interest as a member of the cross-party group on adult survivors of child sex abuse, there is no doubt this continues to be an issue of concern for survivor groups. Um, and I wonder what action the committee feels that we might be able usefully to take. Um, just... Convener, I should also declare an interest. I'm, uh, I've had a number of meetings with Open Secret uh, uh, as, as the local member. Um, they're, they're based in Falkirk District. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> clearly, uh, this has been an ongoing issue for, for some time. and. You know, it has been good to get further clarification from uh, the Scottish Government. I think it just came through yesterday, um, where, where they highlighted that um, it's worth noting that uh, the funding that they've received over November and December represents over 50% of the funding Open Secret would normally receive from the Scottish Government for a whole year's service delivery. But that aside, there are clearly still issues with regard to uh, the service users wishing to continue to receive that service from Open Secret, um, um, and if that service gradually diminishes, then um, there may be a, a serious issue there. So I, I think we should write to the, the Cabinet Secretary for Education and Skills for clarity on the interim finance arrangements that have been put in um, with Open Secret in light of the petitioner's concerns with regard to the cost effectiveness yeah, and the potential loss of uh, of the skills that uh, Open Secret have been providing for a number of years now. Okay. Yes, I, I support that. I should declare an interest to the petitioner as a, as a constituent of mine, and I've had contact with him. Um, I think there needs to be some clarity on the long term. Um, uh, sustainability of, of, of funding and you know for the, from the point of view of the the uh, service users so I think I, I would support what my colleague says uh, the action just to get clarification on that I agree too I've also declared I've spoken with Paul Anderson um, about this and, and and I think that's the best way forward with Mr McDonald as, as uh, recommended <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
I, mean, I think there is an issue, a, a continuing issue about the model that's been used to support survivors, that it's not just a medical model. This is the argument that actually people aren't necessarily ill, they're responding to a circumstance which they found themselves, and therefore we need reassurance around the variety of supports, that they, which may be slightly beyond the remit of the, of the specific petition, but this question of a break trust is actually quite an important one. When it goes beyond uh, a physical medical condition, I think that's where there's a bit of grey area. And, and there have been, there are usually specialist and um, excellent organisations like Open Secret which have developed that kind of support. So if we're agreeing to write to the Cabinet Secretary, it's going to be a busy man, um, for education skills, for clarity on the interim finance arrangements and the other issues that have been highlighted in the petition. There is a suggestion here that we refer the petition to the Education Committee, but if we refer it, we would need to let it go, wouldn't we? So, shall we, no, we wait at this no point? No yeah. no okay, is there anything else we might do? Just, I think, to underline to the petition and others that we do regard this as an issue of, of importance and that we would hope we could get a resolution to it. Okay, is that agreed? Yes. Yeah. Okay, if I can suspend the meeting until we get the next witnesses in. We start the meeting um, and um, we are now moving to agenda item three um, on a new petition on petition 1626 on the regulation of bus services. This petition was lodged by Pat Rafferty on behalf of Unite Scotland, but can I welcome David Ayer um, on behalf of Unite Scotland um, to this morning's meeting along with Ian Taylor who is Director of Transport for Quality of Life and can I thank um, David for stepping in. Obviously there have been transport this difficulties this morning but I appreciate very much um, your input. Can I ask if you want to make a brief opening statement, no more than five minutes after which we will move to questions from committee members. Thank you convener. Can I thank the convener and the committee for rejigging your agenda and attempt to, to, make, the, to make sure that Pat got here and, and pass on his apologies to the committee. Unite is the biggest union representing bus workers in Scotland and the bus services of this country are of extreme importance to us. Since 2006, we have subsidised the bus industry in Scotland to the tune of around £2.6 billion, but that public investment is not delivering the bus services that the people of Scotland expect or deserve. Routes are being slashed, passenger journeys are falling, prices are rocketing, and quite simply, our deregulated bus system is failing the people of Scotland. From June 2016, the Hod the Bus campaign was supported by members of Unite's community branch in the village of Banton in North Lanarkshire. The bus operator their first group, had announced plans to cut bus routes to Banton and other neighbouring villages because they weren't considered profitable enough. Banton doesn't have any shops, so the bus service was a lifeline service. The cuts would have prevented people getting to work, children would have been unable to go to after-school clubs or even to nursery. Pensioners were left asking, what is the use of a bus pass if there is no bus? We were successful in helping local people secure a trial replacement service, which is actually about to come to an end uh, at, at the moment. But it was clear to us that we had to address the wider problem. Because Banton is far from being an isolated case, here are just a few examples from the last year 
where communities have suffered cuts or complete withdrawal of their bus services in Scotland. Saline and Steel End in Fife, Kelvindale and Ridgery in Glasgow, Eaglesome in East Renfrewshire, Kings Wales near Aberdeen, Shield Hill in Falkirk, Bowness, Loch Ree, Greenlaw, the list goes on and on. And where a private company does pull out, there is nothing that you or me or the Parliament or the Scottish Government or Her Majesty the Queen can do about it. There is no regulation that can force a bus company to maintain a service and there is no measure of social responsibility when it comes to bus cuts. The only thing that matters is money and the only way that local authorities can help is by throwing increased subsidy to the operators in order to maintain services. It doesn't have to be like that. Ian is going to talk about how regulation and common ownership could help us deliver a world-class bus service in Scotland. But we'd just like to conclude with this. This Parliament was brought into being in the hope that it would improve the lives of people. Clean, affordable, reliable bus services are the mark of a civilised nation. And at the moment, we are quite simply failing to deliver that. So let's change that. Let's make this the Parliament that finally delivers the world-class buff services that people in Scotland want and deserve. Thank you. Thank you, David. Yeah. Um, I'd like to make just two points um, in, as introductory points, which arise from a report that we did about how to build a world-class bus system for Britain. Um, the two points are that our bus network should be designed as a network and not left as a chaotic free-for-all. And secondly, that very significant amounts of money are being wasted. So just to elaborate on those a little bit, um, it may seem an obvious point that your public transport network should be designed. Um, but in fact, the deregulation of buses back in the 80s removed the powers through which local transport authorities could design coherent, integrated networks. And so what we've had since is a situation where the operators, quite logically and naturally, follow the commercial imperative and cherry-pick the best routes. What that leaves is a situation where the local transport authorities are left running behind to try to fill in the gaps and pick up the pieces. This is a highly inefficient way of putting together a public transport network. Now, so I'd insult to injury, it tends to be the same companies that are contracted, with further profit involved, to fill in the gaps for off-peak services and to run to places that are where you need these as socially vital services. So the first step towards building a world-class bus system for Scotland would be to recognise that it should be purposely designed and operated as a public service, not primarily seen as essentially a vehicle for private profit. The second point I'd like to make is about the amounts of money now. We circulated to the committee in advance some rather intimidating looking tables, I'm afraid, but there's just three, three figures I'm going to pick up off the one that is headed up, Scottish Bus Company Profits. And we can go straight to the bottom right-hand corner where there's a figure for the average percentage of profit. It says 8.77%. Let's call that 8.8%. 8.8% profit. Now, that um, is most significant because it is double... The level It's more than double the level of profit that is made under the regulated system in London, which is 3.8%. Now, that difference, you may say, well, what does that amount to in absolute terms? Well, it amounts to about £14 million, pounds, which could be put to good use by the local transport authorities. And, of course, what happens in London is that Transport for London actually decides what the routes will be, and it lets those at a fixed price, and it defines what the services will be, and companies bid in. And it can therefore take the decision that it will make money on the lucrative routes and cross-subsidise socially essential routes in places where it wants those, or times of day, or across weekends, where those routes probably wouldn't otherwise exist. So that's the approach, and that's the approach in London. I would say that it is possible to go one step further, and you see this right across Europe, where the major European cities with world-class uh, transport systems tend to own their public transport networks. And in that case, of course, you can have a not-for-profit system where the figure that is relevant would be the very bottom figure on here, which is 24 million, because you capture the whole profit leakage. I'd go a little bit further and say that it's not just the profit leakage that matters. The other sheets, which I won't go into at this moment, we can look at them in the course of the discussion, um, one of the things that those reveal is that there are other savings that are of an equivalent scale, um, which would come from the efficiencies you get from 
putting the network together in one go, your, tendered, your bill for tendered supported services goes down. And also, what you can do is you can create an attractive network and build patronage. It is, it is well proven now that if you have a simple, attractive ticketing system that covers the whole lot, you have an integrated network, you do grow patronage. And the savings that amount from this, the most significant thing is that they are more, they are more, when you look at these savings, than the austerity cuts that have been made to bus, bus services in recent years. That is the amounts that we're talking about. So where does that leave us, just to finish with? Um, it, it, it's quite ironic, I feel, that it is a Conservative government in Westminster which has take, is taking legislative steps to reverse what actually was a, a Conservative policy in the 1980s of... Um, deregulating buses under, under Margaret Thatcher, of course. And looking to Scotland, I, I find myself astonished, frankly, that there isn't something similar happening in Scotland. I mean, fundamentally, what changed in England from those who have had the discussions is that the, the Treasury clocked that there was a lot of money going to waste. And so it was George Osborne's discussions with the regions and the devolution agenda that pushed this. Um, and I would strongly encourage I would strongly encourage the committee to put this into play in the Scottish context. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. We, we move to questioning. Can I maybe start by saying clearly the petition calls for two things, legislation to regulate bus service in Scotland and inquiry into the benefits of bringing the services, bus service into common ownership. I can see the connection between the two, but is one an inevitable consequence of the other or are there different models that you're looking at? To, you know, what people would define to be common ownership as someone who comes from the cooperative movement I might have a slightly different, or I would recognise a, a range of models. And I wondered if, um, David, you, the union has, where are they in, in relation to, is it possible to do the regulation bit without being absolutely clear about the ownership bit? I think it's certainly true, convener, that we can split the two up, that we, we can have a regulation model that doesn't involve public ownership or, or, or common ownership. But as a union, what our policy is in support of publicly owned transport. We think that is the, the clearest uh, and best route uh, to, to provide the services that the people of Scotland need. And Ian can maybe talk a wee bit more about the, the, the kind of savings that that, that that would give us in Scotland and, and, and the amount of money that would allow us to reinvest uh, in the bus services. So that's why we, we, almost, kind of, we almost kind of split the, the petition into two. We, we, we think that, that a regulation model is something that the, that the Parliament should definitely look at and, 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 and legislate on. But as a union, we believe that public ownership and, and common ownership, we deliberately said common ownership because there are cooperative models that, that, that could be looked at as well as the, the traditional municipal models uh, and nationalised Scottish bus group model that we used to have uh, in this country, uh, that the parliament should, should take evidence on that. And perhaps further down the road, that, that, that that's something that could be looked at. And any legislation that was brought forward to regulate buses could also include the possibility of, of public ownership or common ownership. Uh, further down the road, I don't know if Ian's got something to just, add. Just, just, Sorry. To, just to remind us again in terms of the evidence, you're saying that there's how much money been subsidised and or given to buses since? since it was two point six billion pounds. So it's about a, uh, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a lot of a, a, a lot of money that, that that's. And at the same time, bus routes have dropped and and fares have gone up. Since, two, since 2007, the number of journeys by bus has, has fallen by 74 million. That's a 15% drop. Um, since number, 2006, the number of bus routes in Scotland, that's the official routes that are registered with the Traffic Commissioner, uh, have fallen by 21%. So we've got fewer bus routes, falling passenger numbers, and bus fares have gone up by 18% in the last five years. So people are paying more and more for a service that's, that's, that's worse and worse. And would you know what the balance of use of buses as opposed to trains are? Yes, the, 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 bus, the bus is the major mode of public transport. There are more journeys made by bus in, in the UK than any other form of transport. So, and, of course, it is disproportionately used, I can put it that way, by people from lower income groups, um, those that don't own cars, and uh, by women and older people. And I, I think in, just to pick up on the, the point that was made about the amounts of money and so on. I think one of the things that is not broadly appreciated is that actually 40% of the money that is uh, made, 40% <laughs> of the money in the bus system comes from the public purse. It's not just the tendered bus services that receive public support. Because we support um, 
concessionary fares for older people and because we give direct um, support uh, through a bus services operators grant. 40% of the total money going into buses comes from the public purse, but that is not something where we have uh, uh, any say over how it is spent. We don't control the routes. And, and this, is, this, is, this is deeply problematic in terms of getting uh, value for money. So uh, your question was about the, the, the different steps. It is certainly the case that regulation is required so that you can get you can actually control what you're getting f for your money. Um, but beyond that, it's very interesting to look at the situation where it is the norm in Europe, really, that public ownership and a not-for-profit system is, is what you'd have. So if you, if you went to a place like Munich, um, they would talk to you about having one area, one network, one brand, uh, and it would be something they've got complete control of. And they would do this under... A public ownership system. In fact, 88% of all local transport trips in Germany are made on publicly owned public transport. And in France, there has been a recent trend of moving towards municipal ownership to get better value. And this has been across the political spectrum. So there's 25 municipalities in France that we counted when we did this report. And they set up things that they call uh, Société <laughs> Excuse my French. Société Publique Locale. Um, and uh, those of municipalities of all political flavours and complexions that have set up what is a local publicly owned transport. And those, those are the advantages once you've done that, that under European law, you can say, we own this, and there is provision under the European directives that say you can exclude competition. So where we do have, and we have excellent... Uh, I mean, Lothian bus is an excellent public transport provider. It is actually fettered, though. It, it, it has to be protective of itself um, um, against the pot potential for incursion. And that means it, it, it can't build the network and do things like cross-subsidise cross the network. So all of these things run together, really. Thank you. I'm OK. Thank you. Um, yes, just with regard to legislation, um, you identified that you supported the members' bill's proposals in, uh, lodged in sessions three and four in the Parliament. The proposal, proposal in session three didn't gather sufficient support and fell before the end of the session. Session four proposal did gather sufficient support to secure the right to introduce a bill, but it fell on dissolution in the absence of a bill not having been introduced. Um, you supported both proposals, and I just wondered if you could say, were you encouraged by the sort of upwards trajectory of the support between the proposals, and, and, and how did you feel about that? Obviously, I wasn't working for United at the time, but I think I can say that, that, the, uh, that the, 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 there did seem to be a change in the way that the, 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 two, the two bills were, were looked at, and it was certainly encouraging <coughs> that there was a wider debate, certainly in the second bill, uh, around the around the proposal, and it did seem that there was more support for 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 the proposal for regulation um, when the, when the second bill came through. I think it's important that this is coming through the public petitions committee because this is a, an issue which I think affects every constituency and, and every every uh, uh, and and therefore every every every. Um, political party that's represented in the Scottish Parliament will have constituents who are, who are suffering as a result of this. Um, it was very interesting during the, the, the process of collecting signatures for this petition. The Parliament's excellent system gives people the ability to make comments as, as, they, 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 as, they, as they sign the petition, and more than uh, 200 people did that uh, when, when they signed the petition. With first-hand examples of how bus cuts were affecting them in their communities, and as, as far as uh, Unite is concerned, it's, it's obviously an important issue to us and, and our members who are directly employed in the bus industry. But as, a, as a union that represents workers across Scotland who rely on bus services to, to get to work, to do their normal business, to get to, to, to have their children get to school, um, th 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 this is, this is a, a, a demand, I think, that's growing and growing in Scotland detecting that you feel that the, there is much, even more uh, of a mood now to, to go down that route. Yeah. That's definitely the case. And yeah. today in the gallery we've got representatives of the Get Glasgow Moving campaign who have been very active in Glasgow, where we have 49% of people in, in, in Glasgow who don't have access to a car. And, and the public transport system, the buses in particular in Glasgow, are fundamental for, for people in, in Glasgow to get around. And so I think there is a growing demand in Scotland and a growing expectation from people in Scotland that the Parliament will now act. Thank you. Okay. 
Thank you, Chair. Uh, good morning, Mr. Uh, Mr. Taylor. Um, our briefing note refers to the Scottish Government's preparation uh, for a transfer bill later in the Parliament and, it wor and its work with st uh, stakeholders to develop options for improving bus services. Is this something that you have, have been or would hope to be involved in? We've been directly involved in at the moment. Uh, we would definitely be hoping to be engaged. Would like to be. Def definitely hope to be in, uh, engaged mm -hmm. uh, during the, the, the process of any transport bill. But I think the important thing, Mr. Corey, is that um, as this process goes through the, 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 the petitions committee, that the, the, the Parliament, through this committee, takes the opportunity to listen to the, the voices of the people of Scotland and to, to, to get a, a full picture of the, the, the really terrible impacts that are happening on communities in this country as a result of the deregulated system that we have at the moment. And um, quite often, I think, through a legislative process, stakeholders are very often the people who are already organised. They're, they're, they're the people who are already uh, in organisations, if you like. I think it would be a great thing if the, if the, uh, if the Parliament, through this committee, was able to, to uncover the, the evidence of people on the ground in Scotland and, and not just the usual stakeholders, if, if you like. May I, may you I think you can add, I, sorry. Sorry, I was just going to add a, a slightly different point on stakeholders um, and raise the issue of um, the actual bus companies themselves. Um, now, it could be that one of the reasons that there hasn't been progress in Scotland would be associated with the fact that there's two very large bus companies in Scotland, um, the first group and um, Stagecoach, which is Scotland-based, and neither of whom have shown themselves to be in favour of um, re-regulation. But I would just like to point out that there are bus companies that are in favour of, of re-regulation, and they are some of the big ones as well. So you could go through a list which is Keolis, RATP and Abellio, um, HCT and Tower Transport, and you won't have heard of all of those, but basically um, um, Abellio is a, a big bus company which is um, part of um, the Dutch railway system. RATP is um, something which is a big bus company that runs in, in, in Paris, Keolis is, is also French based. And they are strongly in favour. And it's interesting that all of those have a lot of experience of European systems where, where it is re regulated. And uh, some of these operators have much more experience than first. And I, I think that what they're seeing is that actually they would prefer a system where it, it didn't have a lot of what this is wasteful uh, re requirements to sort of be fending off. Uh, what is seen as inefficient in a, in, in a more European perspective, inefficient uh, competition. Okay, can I ask supplementary? Sorry, Chair. Um, the, the TFL, Transport for London model, you referred to earlier on. I mean, what, where are the good points of that that would probably be good for Scotland? I, I think the starting point should be that something like a franchising system should be your um, it should be your default option, really. Um, I would say that if you're going to adopt that. I think that I would start with some duties on the local transport authorities. I think if, we're going to, if, they're, going, if they're going to have the powers to re-regulate, they should also have duties. And those duties should be very simple. They should just be a duty to increase bus use and improve bus services. And that those don't exist at the moment. But as soon as you have those duties, as a local authority, you'll be saying, well, how do we do this? And if you look at the Urban Transport Group, which is the body that oversees all of the passenger transport executives and, the, and these others, uh, they would say you know, something like franchising should be the default option. There have been attempts to set up legislation that works, of course, um, in uh, previous transport bills, and they've just proved too tortuous. Um, Nexus, the North East um, Authority in Newcastle, tried to go through the legislation that exists to try to get some sort of franchising system, and it was just impossible to, for them to, to complete that. But the London system has a lot to recommend it, uh, and you could improve on it by um, actually saying that you would do what has been proposed by the, the latest mayor in London, which is that actually you have a system a bit like in Germany, where in Germany they have Tariff Troja, where they say we will impose some across the board um, paying conditions minima, so you'll, you must pay your drivers the minimum wage and this sort of thing but it, it basically works it works pretty well in, in, in London and you can achieve one of the biggest things that you can achieve under that kind of system which you which you cannot do um, under a deregulated system is you can get a system where you've got one network one brand 
one ticket. And, and you can achieve a system where you can have a smart pay-as-you-go system where it's capped at the end of the day, one that it is illegal under the present system to stop bus companies setting their own single fare. It's illegal under the competition law, and it's this is this is rubbish. I mean, you want to be, you want to know that you can that you can have a nice simple ticket, and that you, to do an oyster style thing, which is the longer thing, you you you, you know you're going to get the best deal because whichever bus company you get on it can be it can be RATP, Abellio, Go. You see them all on the back, but of course they're all red. They've all got one brand, and at the end of the day, if you've travelled on lots of different ones, it'll cap it, and you know you've got the best, and you just cannot. That is impossible under the deregulated system. It, 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 if you go down the franchising system and you've got regulation, you can say, this is the fair structure, and this is what they say in Munich. You know, one network, one ticket, one brand. And you you can invest in, in, in that. Yeah, okay, thanks, thanks very much. Uh, Angus MacDonald. Okay, thanks, um, convener. Good morning, David. Good morning, Ian. Um, you've clearly put uh, forward a well-argued case uh, so far, for which I've got a, a lot of sympathy. Um, in terms of, uh, I mean, you've clearly done a lot of research or, uh, into this already, but in terms of bringing bus services back into uh, common ownership, it, do you have any further suggestions as to how, how this might be achieved? And was there anything that came out of the research uh, that you commissioned um, that, that you haven't highlighted yet? And, and I'm, I'm in particular interested in wondering if you could list any other nations in Europe where uh, buses are in common ownership or where they've successfully re-regulated. Um, you mentioned political consensus in France um, and the situation in Germany. Uh, if you have any other examples, for example, um, you know, is, is there a similar situation in uh, the Nordic region that you're aware of? Um, OK. Well, I. Th th these are interesting questions, and I'm afraid to say that they start to go into the 150-page version of this report, rather than, the, rather than this is the exact. You've just got the, the short summary here, but um, to, I'll be very, I'll be very, very brief. Um, I think it's quite straightforward. If you move to a franchising system, then if you want to move to a publicly owned system beyond that, um, it, it would just be a question of letting. Um, the franchising routes one by one lapse if you wanted to do it very gradually. Um, the essential thing is that if you invest in a publicly owned company, of course there are 12 in the UK that still exist, Lothian's really the biggest and arguably the best really, um, but the, y y you, can, you can take them over gradually or you could, if you're a neighbouring authority to one which has its own municipal, you could buy into that. It's, it's fundamentally not difficult to set up a bus company because if you wanted to lease the buses, you don't have to buy the whole stock, you can lease them. So I'd say it's, there's no fundamental obstacles. And of course, yes, there are other European examples one could look at. Austria, the bulk of the cities are, you know, go through Salzburg, Vienna, all of these. They have publicly owned networks that they put together in that way. Um, around three years ago, when I think it was the second bill uh, was being debated, it was suggested that um, the total cost to regulate bus services in Scotland would be around £1 billion. Now, I have to say, at that point, Ian Gray said that was rubbish. Um, so, <laughs> um, so I'm just wondering, have you costed it uh, at all? Um, are there any figures that, uh, that you've, you've brought about through your research? Um, yes, in, in one of the other tables that we have um, put in front of you. We've got financial gains from franchising. We've also got costs of, of franchising. This is the one that's labelled Table 5.1. I should perhaps just explain that if you're thinking all oh, these numbers are a bit different to the other table, they come from a, a slightly different approach. Uh, when we did the report, we had Britain-wide figures, and so these numbers on here, where the Scottish totals are done as a pro rata on the amount of turnover of the bus companies in Scotland. But before this committee, we did a little bit of rush research, <laughs> and we actually, um, Unite very kindly, um, pulled out all sorts of company accounts, and I analysed this on uh, Friday and Monday. And so th the two are actually commensurate. It turns out that the pro rata was very close, but what we've done with these figures also, we've been able to exclude Lothian buses. But just to come back to what your question was, which is about what are the costs of franchising, um, We've got an estimate here that says, well, it may cost you 
um, a couple of million in terms of adding capacity within the local authorities that don't have it to do franchise. And I should say that re-regulation is as valuable in the rural areas as in the urban areas. It really is. There have been very good pre deregulation regulated systems in, in, in rural areas. And then also, there is a cost that comes in um, bidding, running competitions, because bus companies do have to bid in. Uh, we estimated that at about a million. Um, these are... Um, these, the, the cost of the bidding, uh, it isn't immediately apparent, but it will go into the system. Eventually it comes out as a, as a, as a cost. So, so those, are, those are a small proportion relative to the, the savings, and they're nowhere near the sorts of uh, rubbish numbers that you uh, referred to. Can I maybe ask just very um, quickly a, a slightly separate question? Um, I think... You, I noticed that you've got the Hold the Bus campaign and, and folk from Glasgow as well as um, a union representing the workforce and indeed um, from the Cooperative Party they have the People's Bus campaign so there's clearly a kind of demand across a, a range of organisations. But I know that Unite spoke specifically about the consequence for people working in a bus industry of a deregulated system where presumably there's such competition that there's pressure on, on terms and conditions. Have you got some examples of kinds of conditions in which bus drivers are now operating in, in a system where there appears to be a, there's a lot of money, there are fewer routes, um, the mo it's costing more, but what what is it like for folk who are working in the industry? Of course, it's not just bus drivers, it's also people who are working and maintaining the buses and, and, and um, uh, people who are cash carriers who carry the cash from the buses to, 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 the, um, to the counting offices uh, and bus cleaners. Uh, as well. Now, all of these professions are under pressure, and in Glasgow, for for example, we've had uh, examples where bus depots have been closed uh, in, uh, in, in, in uh, Parkhead, for example, and centralised at Caledonian uh, in, uh, in the Gorbals. And uh, anecdotally, we, we know that, that there are fewer pits now to maintain the buses, that um, that's causing increased pressure on the people who are trying to to, to keep the buses on the road, that as a result of that, there's lost mileage, increased lost mileage on the bus services in Glasgow. Quite often, buses aren't available because they, they, they haven't been uh, the, the, the capacity there to, to maintain and, and, and repair them. So there's that side of things. But there's also a cash side of things as well. And in Ian's report, he, he made it clear that before bus deregulation, the wage of a bus driver was roughly in, in line with, with average, average wages. And since bus deregulation, uh, average wages have gone up 25% and bus wages, the wages of a, bu a bus driver on average have gone down 11%. So bus deregulation has had an impact not just on passengers but also on the, on the, on the people who are working in the bus industry. It's been bad for people, our members, who, 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 who are working in, in the bus industry. Now, some places are better than others and some companies are better than others and Lothian Buses probably stands out as, as one of the companies that, that is that is. That is uh, in, in terms of its terms and conditions for members, one of the one of the better bus companies, and it's no accident that, that Lothian Buses is uh, a municipally municipally owned owned company. And te in terms of how we go forward, you know the the, 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 the kind of terms and conditions uh, uh, issue, you would imagine under a franchise model, as has happened in London, where the mayor has now started to put in place. Uh, as in terms of the franchise, um, talking about terms and conditions of, of bus drivers and other, other people who work in the industry, that that's something that could also be replicated uh, here in Scotland under the franchise system. So it would be good for our members. And we are in danger now, I think, in Scotland. We have a franchising system in London. There's a bus services bill going through Westminster that could potentially roll out a, a, a franchising system to every local authority in England. We have a municipally owned still bus service in Northern Ireland. And Scotland could be left on the edge unless we take action now. Thanks very much, Brian. Good morning, gentlemen. Um, our, our briefing refers to the number of questions lodged which have some relevance to the issue raised within your petition. For example, in response to a question what action the Scottish Government is taking to protect bus services, the Minister for Transport and the Islands referred to the £50 million funding through the Bus Service Operators Grant and £60 million funding to allow local authorities to support their local bus services. I wondered if, if you had a, an opinion or position on that. It, it, an opinion or position on, on whether that was good money or well spent? Yes. Or? yes. Okay. 
Uh, this comes back to the point that it, it's good money. <laughs> it's great to see that money going into to buses, and I think that the case for supporting buses as a public service is, is very strong indeed. Um, my contention would very strongly be that for that money, you should be able to achieve your policy objectives for buses, and I don't think that the level of control you put the money in and the bus companies can do what maximises the profit for them within that, which they logically will do, and they will do it, they will do it well. Um, but at the moment, if you want to do things like have concessionary fares for older people, or for young people, or for disabled people, you're going to pay through the nose for it, really. That's the way that it works. Whereas in the London system, under the London system, you just... That's part of the deal. You know, you contract the route, and then it has to carry these people for free or for whatever. Uh, under the system we've got, there's a system which is quite controversial, really, about how the how the, the fare system works, which is that the bus companies will say, well, we're going to get... We're going to get more money if we have high fares because they get reimbursed on their own. So one of the reasons we tend to have rather high rural fares, and I happen to live in Wales, and we have very high fares, uh, it is contended by those that are in the know that really it's because if you have high set fares, you get reimbursed more for your concessions. And then there's the fact that the, the regime doesn't work very well if the, if the bus companies decide, oh, we'll put on a whole new route, you still end up reimbursing for what should have been cost neutral. So I think... There's a question of how this money is spent, but I think it goes much beyond this as well. I think that's only the direct money. We should be aware that the public purse is also building bus priority measures. It is the public authorities that go around um, putting in bus, bus stations, bus stops. It's also the local transport authorities that have to run around doing the timetables, the, the leafleting, and all of this sort of thing. And, and if you go to many places, there is there is not an overall network map. I mean, you can get a network map for Leicester, for example. It says map of the bus network in Leicester uh, and by Arriva. But it isn't a map of the bus network. It's just a map of the Arriva bus network in Leicester. So all these things. Um, and, and the point I'm trying to work towards is that, in fact, we've got the local authorities putting in bus priority money and all sort of money, but it's, 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 um, it's something which is doing a lot of the work for the bus companies themselves. I mean, we wouldn't expect to be doing marketing for Tesco's. We, we do this. We do this for the bus companies. And, and yet for this, um, it, it, they call it commercial service. And actually, with 40% of your, your income coming from the public purse and all of the infrastructure being laid on by the public purse, we really haven't got a sufficient control over the, over the system. Okay. Um, are, you, are you concerned at all that the subsidies are not spread equally between larger and smaller uh, bus operators or equitably? Is there a need to strike a balance between commercial need and, and social need? I, I presume that's what you're alluding to, really. I mean, uh, as, as I said in the, in the, in the opening, the, the only mechanism that we have at the moment where a bus company decides that a, that a route is, is not profitable is for the, for the local authority to, to, to subsidise that route. And it would depend where, in, in, in different areas. For example, in Lothian, uh, where, where we have a, a publicly owned bus service, um, uh, uh, anecdotally, the, 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 the amount of bus support that goes into support subsidised routes <coughs> is less than other areas in, areas in Scotland. Uh, for example, uh, I mentioned Banton. The, the service that's been running in Banton for the last six months is only running because North Lanarkshire Council are funding it. Um, Maybe Ian's got more figures. Right I, I think I think some of the smaller bus operators might uh, find your question quite resonant, um, because since deregulation, what we've seen is a situation where the large bus companies have had the muscle to exclude small operators or buy them out. Depends. And what we've now ended up with is essentially a big six across the UK, and you've got a system which functionally is that you have a cartel of local monopolies. That's putting it really bluntly, but that's what we've got. And the, this was not what was meant to happen under deregulation. It wasn't what was, And this is presumably one of the reasons that there is a, a turning back against what has happened. Now, what the franchising system does is that it gives quite a simple way in for smaller operators. You know, Hackney Community Transport has grown, which, um, and I think this was one of China Lamont's questions about, uh, about different forms of... Um, not-for-profit and a corporate ownership. It is a not-for-profit 
a group. It started as a community transport group in London, worked under the franchise system. It's now grown to a 40 million turnover. It's a nationwide group and runs uh, all of the buses in Jersey and Guernsey under the franchising there. So the small operators quite... And the, some of the smaller operators have very good reputations. They've had to be really good <laughs> to survive against the big guys. And um, they... Yeah, They've, some of the local, local authorities make an attempt to sustain them under the present tendering system because they don't want to be had over a barrel by the big operator. So, you know, it's, it's almost universally the case that the, the more canny uh, of the local authority officers who are doing, if you like, limited contracting at the moment are trying to cut them into pieces that the smaller operators can bid for. The other thing is that if you're bidding on a simple thing with the routes defined, you don't have to worry about revenue forecasts and all this sort of thing because actually as a small operator you've just got to say what's it going to cost me to run this service so the deregulation has been quite a difficult thing for small operators but you could design it to, you could design re-regulation so that it is across the board quite good for the, some of the very small operators who we're lucky to have from where I live I'm very lucky to have a very good small operator and we wouldn't have services otherwise yeah, I suspect that we could uh, discuss this for another three hours, um, and because there's so many different issues, including one we've not really touched, which is the capacity of community transport to deliver a service as well, and, and, and so on. But and I don't want unnecessarily to close it down, but we do have to to move on. There are pressures on our time. Um, I note that uh, Pat Rafferty has is now in, in the gallery, um, and um, regret that for transport challenges. <laughs> Because of transport challenges, you're unable to be here. But, however, I think it would be fair to say that the, 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 the evidence coming from the, the representatives has been really, really um, useful. I don't know if you have any very last brief comments before we look at how we might take it forward. one point, which you haven't asked as a question and possibly should have done, uh, which is that people... Excuse me, saying so. Um, people, people, one of the counter-arguments that people come up with is say, uh, but London has lots of money and the London system is terribly expensive, surely. And, and, and this isn't a valid point uh, uh, for two reasons. The first is that uh, uh, up until the year 2000, uh, actually uh, support to bus service in London was run down and uh, got to virtually zero. But the patronage held up in a way it didn't in other areas. And secondly, if you actually look at the patronage in terms of the value uh, per trip, the subsidy levels per trip made in London are lower than elsewhere. And so I thought I'd just throw that in as a parting shot since it's one of the counter arguments that does tend to come up. Thank you very much for your time, though. <laughs> we didn't ask, but we'll bear that in mind for the future. But obviously, I would say that maybe to Pat Rafter in particular, but to others, that if there's following this evening session and there's things you want to follow up with the, the committee, feel free um, to do so. So in terms of how we want to take this forward, we need to think, I, I think I would be speaking for the committee and recognising there is an issue here, it's something we want to look further at, so I don't know if there are any suggestions of what we might do. Well, it would seem to me that I'd quite like to... to uh, seek the Scottish Government his views um, on the action of this petition, but uh, specifically around um, the involvement of stakeholders in sort of legislative options for improving the service as part of the preparation for the Transport Bill. Mm -hmm. I think we can agree that. I, th I, think, I, think, so, yeah. uh -huh. I think it's essential. We, 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 we go right to the Government yeah. and, and seek uh, their views, and, and as Brian says, to the, the, the various other stakeholders, just so we can get a much yeah. a very complete picture. Chair, mm -hmm. into the question of talking to, I agree entirely on both those as stakeholders as well being written to, is we include uh, specifically Strathclyde passenger transport, because they cover quite a lot of issues yeah. on that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A range of um, stakeholder organisations, including the unions, COSLA, mm -hmm. um, and various community and transport groups across the country that we might ask for information. I think what at this stage we're seeing is there is an issue here. There's a question of the level of public subsidy and the nature of the service that's been delivered. I think we would need to reflect further on whether we would want to go to the second bit of the petition, which is to look at whether there should be it should be an inquiry on whether it's a viable thing for us to do or somebody else in the system, but I don't think that's something we're closing down at this point, so that we would want to seek as much um, uh, information as possible and then we can come back and reflect on that, but specifically to Scottish Government. Yeah. I'm just going to with the other stakeholders, as we're saying in the note. Okay, so we've already identified 
stakeholders have been COSLA, the Regional Transport Partnerships, the Bus Stakeholder Group, the Association of Transport Coordinating Officers, the Confederation of Passenger Transport Scotland, and as we said, passenger groups, I think community transport groups, um, Bus Users Scotland and the Scottish Association for Public Transport. I think if there are further suggestions of groups that we could um, look to, um, to contact directly, we, we can do. And you know, obviously, Unite will want maybe to respond, but there may be other um, unions with an interest in, in this that might want to respond as well. Uh -huh, Angus? Um, yeah, thanks, Camille. I'd, I'd also be keen, given that the, um, uh, the bus services bill that's currently going through Westminster has been mentioned today, I'd be keen to get a paper from Spice on exactly where Westminster is with that and some more detail. But I think there has been some, well, it's been given in evidence that there's a shift in policy position elsewhere, elsewhere in the United Kingdom. OK, um, if that's agreed, then can I again thank the witnesses for their evidence. Thank you for your attendance today. Um, this will be something that obviously we will be revisiting and we will keep you informed. If there are further points you want to feed into the committee, please feel free to do so. And can I suspend the meeting um, while we change petition, uh, witnesses? the meeting back together again and can I now move to petition 
1625 on the wider awareness, acceptance and recognition of pathological demand avoidance syndrome. Um, we will hear evidence from the joint petitioners, Patricia Hewitt and Mary Black. They are accompanied by Ewan Robson and Heather Fulbrook, so I would welcome you to the meeting. Um, you have the opportunity to make a brief opening statement of up to five minutes, uh, and after that, the committee will ask a few questions to help inform our consideration of the petition. But can I thank you very much for being here today? I don't know what, who wants to start. Um, this is from Pat that I'm going to speak on her behalf. There are two boys in her case, one 19 and the other 20. There was no early intervention. The youngest behaviour was classed as lazy and winging it at school. We have children like this all the time and ignored my concerns. He was removed from nursery for months because he said he was too hyperactive and immature. He had schools referred him that they would have found out differently. At no stage was I made aware that I could have asked for an assessment of their needs. I found that out too late. The eldest behaviour was put down to post-traumatic stress disorder after their father died. He was in a heart transplant list for five years, then died of a misdiagnosed cancer of the stomach. Mental Adult mental health services diagnosed my eldest son within weeks with Asperger's at 18. His brother was diagnosed at 17 with Asperger's by CAMS. And after years of cancellations and failed appointments to do these assessments, I knew he was different and, and pleaded with, with them to transfer him to, medical, to adult <coughs> services who diagnosed ADHD when he was young and now has ADD. My boys have been, been humiliated and degraded without their school years and denied a normal childhood and education. It was not for the lack of trying to get answers by my GP. So many people failed us, not just CAMS, but when sick kids fail to recognise this type of seizures, Asperger's and PDA, I think it was time to worry. And in the end, I recognised 90% of the issues. My goodness, my GP believed me. It was a comment made by an instrumental music teacher comparing students and seeing Mary's article in the press about Hannah and PDA and then reading Jane Sherwin's book, My Daughter Is Not Naughty. It was like a life belt, belt moment for me. My eldest son had been handcuffed by police after he trashed his bedroom in a meltdown. Neighbours and police searched for him in the dark on other occasions. My parenting skills have been questioned. I was offered a parenting course. At that time, I just wanted to end my life because no one would help me, no one would listen to me. One police control assistant even called me an unfit mother. I asked my GP to remove the eldest to a homeless unit. I could not cope with his behaviour anymore. I had to live with this guilt and still do. This has been a massive effect on both my mental and physical health and I now need your help, which I don't get. I also care for my sister four days a week who has numerous medical problems and I have been abandoned by social work and cams and muddled as best as I can. Due to the techniques that have not been used, my children have failed so many exams at the latter end of their school career. The refusal of adequate support for the youngest resulted in severe sleep deprivation. He was staying up 24, 36 hours. He never returned to school. We rescued one exam. An inspirational tutor listened to the story at Edinburgh College last June and they are now using the PDA strategies to help him in his classical musical studies. We believe he is the first PDA student at college. His private instrumental tutor is working with the college. My faith in the education system has been restored by this team and for the first time in his life, my son is happy in a safe, caring environment who has, been unwill who has been willing to listen and learn. My eldest son's primary seven teacher in primary school said he would be able to pick and choose which university, university he went to, Oxford, Cambridge, St Andrews. Well, he is on employment support allowance and a support group. He is a virtual recluse. I still don't have an accurate diagnosis for both boys. I believe both fit the profile of a rare syndrome. We have recently been refused an out-of-area referral for PDA. My eldest son was never the same after an accident at school where he received second-degree burns to a hand after he failed to provide protective gloves. 
He was not given correct first aid and was in agony for months. Months later, he started to have seizures. These are still uncontrollable, but we now have the right diagnose. Another consultant who listened to the story. He was bullied from primary two to S6 and eventually bullied out of school. He could not control anything in his life because the PDA was not recognised. The long-term damage was done. The local additional support needs group have refused to support us and the local authority does not support PDA or our CAMS. My biggest fear is, is what happens once I die. And unless people are made aware of PDA and the strategies required, I am so frightened that my boys will land up in prison or a care home, homeless, or at the worst, taking drugs and alcohol. When I first went to my GP and asked him what he knew about PDA, he replied, I'm really sorry, but nothing. Listen and learn. And I have been ma managing to work with him and we have worked together and they have now seven confirmed cases of PDA in their practice in the Scottish borders. I need hope for the future. My boys will need 24 hour seven support. Scotland has totally failed them so far. Prove to me and so many other parents with children and young adults out there that you do listen to the parents and spread the awareness of the formally recognised PDA. Very much for that. Now, now that's a statement from Patricia. Have you something before I've to just say got for yourself? Yeah. Well, first of all, I'd like you to thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak to you today regarding this Autism Spectrum Disorder PDA and the petition you will have sight of, which is signed by parents, professionals in the field of research, medicine, social care and education. I am the parent of five children. Four of my children are very successful educationally and are very happy in life. Two are currently in university and the others are in very good employment. However, as a family, this has had a massive impact on us. As we knew from a very young age, Hannah was different, so different from other children. On Hannah starting nursery, it was very clear, and our nursery teachers had told us that something wasn't right. Hannah was different. I turned to all the professionals for help and advice and was sent to parenting classes. After that, it was just like being on a hamster wheel, going round and round in circles, and eventually they discharged me. For 11 years, I have been blamed and quizzed about my family, and this has caused severe mental health to myself and my family, and also to Hannah. Hannah is age 13, and she's so different from her brothers and sisters. She can be a very loving, caring, and happy young girl, and with the correct care and understanding. Last May 2016, she even managed to climb Ben Nevis in under four and a half hours. Hannah can also be controlling, extremely demand avoidant, highly anxious most of the time due to the social communication and interaction difficulties that she has. She can become very verbal and physically aggressive, particularly towards her family. Hannah has a profile of PDA, which is on the autistic spectrum disorder. I know she, she has this development disorder through all the research and the therapeutic residential school that Hannah went to in 2015 for six weeks had picked this up within a few weeks during assessments. Their conclusion was that Hannah had to have access to a specialist services that understand the need of young people that has got a complex atypical ASD PDA and needing 24-hour care. Here in Scotland, I cannot find a professional who understands PDA and is able to diagnose this disorder. There are several specialists in England that has been trained to access and diagnose this disorder, and I and many parents in Scotland feel this is a need, needs to be available in Scotland. Even though Hannah hasn't yet been diagnosed officially for PDA, I and my family have been using the management and behaviour strategies for children with PDA, and we have seen how much this has made a difference to Hannah in this last year. But Hannah still needs an education that can meet all her special needs related to PDA. So whoever educates Hannah will have a greater understanding of PDA, the strategies needed to keep her calm so that she can learn, and so far, the education department has failed to provide the suitable education for Hannah, and she has remained at home for me for the last couple of years because they don't have any idea what to do with her. Hannah's primary school for the last six years, 
She has spent most of that time being excluded because of her, her extreme anxiety and meltdowns leading to be restrained, been handcuffed. PDA is part of the autistic spectrum, but it should not be diagnosed as an ASD. And this is because strategies that are known not to, to work with PDA children, in fact, it can make them a lot worse and can affect their emotional and mental health, i.e. anxiety, depression, self-harm. And children with PDA often do not get that diagnosed because they're labelled as naughty children. And as being on the autistic spectrum, because they can give more eye, high, more eye contact, high functioning and very intellectual, they can also mask their difficulties at appointments and appears to have superficial skills. It takes a very specialist ASD psychologist who has been trained in EDOS, Autistic Diagnostic Observation Schedule, and is trained to recognise not just ASD but particular marker traits of PDA. There are a couple of places in England where professionals can train to accurately diagnose ASD and PDA, Bromley Ken and to name others. And without this professional that without this training, professional psychologists will not be able to recognise PDA and note how it relates to the autistic spectrum. If children with PDA do not get the accurate assessment, diagnose and support educationally that they need, their outcomes will be very poor, i.e. mental health difficulties are being sectioned, suicide, educationally they will not achieve or finish school and therefore could become criminal offenders. But with the correct assessment, diagnose and support for their children with PDA, they could go on to college, university and into employment and live fulfilled lives. Early intervention is the key to good outcomes for children with PDA, but accurate assessments and diagnose very in early intervention cannot be given to this very complex and challenging group of children. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'm asking you please to make changes in Scotland to ensure all our children get the care and understanding they deserve to find their way in, what, in the world and when they are no longer on this earth to care for them as PDA is a long-life disability. Okay, thank you very much for that. And I think these are very substantial statements, so perhaps some of the questions that we would have already, you know, in that very full statement, there's lots and lots for us to think about there. But perhaps if I can start off and, and thanking you for those statements. The first aim of your petition is to promote a wider awareness of PDA syndrome, probably by actually being here today and making these statements you have already come quite a long way in terms of raising awareness. And you provide a lot of reference sources in your petition, and the briefing information we have that's been gleaned for us does similar. I wonder how you think um, these reference sources can be pro pro um, promoted and accessed and encourage people to be aware of these questions. How, the very fact there are resources there, how do we make them, how do you think we can make them more publicly available to people? At the minute, there doesn't seem to be any recognition whatsoever. Um, when you go into MAC meetings, when you go into different meetings with different agencies, there is no recognition for it, for the parents. And to publicise this, you would have to do a campaign the same way you did with autism. It wasn't a recognised disorder. Asperger's wasn't a recognised disorder. Education is definitely the key for the services, for health, education and social work. We do need to educate at the very top and work it down because they just simply don't recognise it. Thanks for that. Rona Mackay? Yes, just following on from the convener's question, um, do you think um, if awareness is improved um, generally, um, do you think that would, would generate acceptance and recognition um, of the condition? You know, if the public were more aware of it, do you think one would follow the other? Yes. Yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. um, when you think the first case was recognised in 1998 by an inspirational team in North Lanarkshire, she was taken down to Nottingham. And, of course, you know, the famous, you know, Professor Newson diagnosed this child. She was given one-to-one -one through school till she was 15. How has it that happened? And my GP hadn't even heard and until I saw Mary's article in the paper I'd never heard of it before and of course it, it was when I was reading the book there was once mine were diagnosed and it was me who recognized it I was just blatantly ignored by the schools 
Um, and it landed up where, you know, talking to the teachers, their understanding of autism spectrum was absolutely shocking. And that includes going back to the primary school teachers. I don't know if they need any training whatsoever to be a learning support teacher, but their understanding of autism is absolutely yes, shocking. Um, and very significant training for learning support, but that's a that's just like obviously a separate a, a different mm -hmm. point. Um, but you know the other part of it is you know just explaining things simply. Everything you get is so complicated that CAMS didn't recognise between school doctors and CAMS for eight years telling my son it was post-traumatic stress disorder. Then it's me who's worked all the different parts of it out. Uh, is really really concerning, and you know people like. Um, the sick kids that they didn't get sort of the type of epilepsy and you know the autism spectrum plus the PDA is really really concerning um, and had there been early intervention at the start one I wouldn't have had police at my front door my child in handcuffs his whole life has been absolutely destroyed because that the one thing about PDA is anxiety that's us normal sort of anxiety sitting here half terrified children with Asperger's, their anxiety is about their PDA is just off the ceiling. What you've, you've got to be 10 steps ahead all the time. You can actually watch the anxiety and you have to sort of get in quick to sort of distract them. Um, not being rude, my normal one is politicians. And I said to him, have you seen what so-and-so in America said today or who so-and-so said? And, you know, sort of turn it into sort of a bit of fun and then you can sort of distract them and then you can see the anxiety going down. Even to get my child, the youngest one, out of bed is a nightmare. When you think all these demands, get out of bed, brush your teeth, brush your hair, go in the shower, have you got all your things ready? So you've got all these demands, Every hit them. And the one thing schools don't understand is school refusal. They cannot understand why, you know, you will get your child to school and that's the end of it. They do not understand what's happening at home. Because we have to get them out of bed to start with. Mm -hmm. And that's a massive, massive demand. Yeah. And then sort of for mine, sort of, getting into the taxi, then getting on a bus, that the help he needs is just, you know, unbelievable. Um, and as I say, since we've now put the PDA strategies in a college, and that is instrumental teachers working, that everybody's working together, if we hadn't have done this, he wouldn't be at college. And it's as simple as that. Hi. Um, the situation in England, you, you mentioned a particular um, uh, practitioner, but ha are there more? I mean, ha what's... Oh, it's all over the world. We've, yeah. we've got people from America. I've just talked to a lady in Croatia. The whole world is affected by this. It is that important. But, but I'm meaning like specialists who recognise and are aware of the condition. That, I think you mentioned it's, it's there's a very, situations different in yeah, England. Yeah, there's very few. Actually, there is some in Scotland because um, there was a lady in Inverness and her seven-year-old was handcuffed. Uh, it was just absolutely horrendous and she told them for three years because she's a nurse that this child had PD, PDA. Cam's just totally ignored her and it landed up eventually she got a referral across to York Hill. York Hill diagnosed the, the PDA. There's also a lady online who was saying that she's got a child diagnosed up in um, Aberdeen. There's little clicks. I mean, I... Yeah, it is recognised that there are. I found out this is why I was asking about this referral because online on the PDA Society, um, I sort of private messaged this this family who were saying they had a diagnosis up in Edinburgh, a 19 year old. She's in a homeless unit with mental health difficulties, and because CAMS had failed there to recognise. No there's nothing. You get told that your child's got PDA, like. With my daughter, when I was told last last year, well, 2015, and since then, the education cams discharged me. They didn't believe it. They says it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. Got on with it, and and they actually discharged me and left me on my own. Hence, that I did then go public to try and raise awareness to say to them, this is what's wrong. I mean, I had to witness my child, in the back of a police van, being manhandled because of her, her sheer anxiety, I had to stand there watching my child in the back of this police van and being handcuffed and thrown us, and that was awful. All because of the lack of, it doesn't exist, there is not such a thing. 
as PD, it will prove that it does exist because of the original yeah. case. And you know, the, how the, it's the cans who who are poor, who are not recognising PDA. The ones who are really good. I mean, it goes from one extreme to another. It goes from absolutely brilliant to absolutely appalling. And it's the same in the education. I you know, was told only last year, in a MAC meeting. Don't bother wasting any money going privately to get your child diagnosed officially with PDA from one of the profet because it isn't rec it doesn't exist. It's your cell. It's the way you brought your child up. We're getting a lot of, of, of information here that maybe we don't need to now to ask those questions. But I wonder, Brian, can I ask you to come in with your question? Um, I think I was going to ask you in the. Um, in the petition summary, you refer to appropriate agencies and bodies in terms of training, uh, developing therapeutic programmes and providing support. Do you have a thought on what or who these appropriate agencies might be? The National Autistic Society, for one, they've got a, a wonderful yeah. school down just outside Rotherham, and they have a specialised hub, and there's about, I think, either 17 or 18 children in there, and they're given specialist you know, education, um, social skills, everything like that. It's just absolutely amazing. And there are schools in Scotland who will work with these children. Uh, when you think about it, my two went through mainstream. It was absolute hell for both of them. But the eldest one managed to, um, he, re he represented the whole of the Scottish borders in like a Connects competition. Um, and the youngest one has been to Germany with Borders Chamber Orchestra. He was up at Inverness last year um, with Edinburgh Classical, you know, col the College Orchestra. And this, you, you, if you saw him, you wouldn't think he was autistic. But as, as I say, every strategy you've had, early intervention, and the biggest bugbearer is the Additional Support for Learning Act, because that's just been... When Scottish ministers say, yes, you know, you, you don't need a diagnosis. This is the biggest thing people do not know about, like the education side, that you don't need a diagnosis. And then you have a legal duty to refer. If When you think education minister said, yes, that's right, and you, you just get fobbed off to inquire and govern law centre, this, and the general teaching council didn't want to know, um, the, the, everybody just didn't want to know. It's just unbelievable. But as I say, if you went to somewhere like that, to the, one of these specialist schools and listen to, this is the, the bottom, listen to the parents. We are just totally ignored, you know, when I was saying that the, the youngest one was sort of, you know, outside of school, had all these issues. He was a nightmare getting to school. Oh, my children are like that. Uh, and it was just absolute horrendous what they put them through. But if you, if you go to these specialist places and see what they're doing, we were up at Barhead a little while ago on a training with the, the PDA Society, and you were listening to some of these teachers, and one of the teachers said something which the, the most f brilliant thing in her career is to get a child who's got PDA right through the school system and give them an education. She said it's the most rewarding thing out. Yeah, one of my neighbours is a teacher and she just said to me, Pat, she just said, we do not have the time, we do not have the resources. The easiest thing is for these children just to fall out the system. It's easier for us. You want to come in? If I, if I might convene, uh, can I just, for the record, say I'm here in a private, not a professional capacity. Um, but I think the direct answer to the member's question is, is quite straightforward. There needs to be official recognition of the syndrome. Because when that, if, if that doesn't exist, then there will always be a debate about any provision. And the ideal thing, I think, would be for the Scottish Government to look carefully at this and then give official recognition and issue guidance. And that guidance would then inform uh, the uh, relevant authorities, whether they be health, whether they be uh, in education. Uh, and I think the point is this, that there is evidence, I'm a, I'm a lay person in this, as I suspect all the members of the committee may be, uh, 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 there is evidence that uh, appropriate therapies can lead to fulfilled lives and can reduce the appalling stresses that there are on families. Um, and the sad thing is that well-intentioned interventions or therapies uh, which are not uh, appropriate 
but are appropriate in certain parts of the autistic, spect autistic spectrum, spectrum can actually do more harm than good. They can actually raise the difficulties. So therefore, a recognition of the syndrome, a recognition by the Scottish Government and guidance as to how to, uh, for, for professionals, how to cope, what therapies uh, might be available, what are available, uh, would be enormous assistance. It, for the much PDA, for if, you, if you send sort of a teacher on, a, say, an ordinary autism training course, total waste of time. It's just like sending a plumber on an electrician's course. Completely different strategies. We're, we're told, choose your battles carefully, and literally we do. What we turn our back on, most parents will be absolutely horrified, you know, sort of being told to... F off and all the rest of it. But we know how far we can go because we just do not want to see a meltdown situation. And when you think about it, it's like looking in a sweet shop. This is the PDA part of it. They want to go in, but the demand avoidance are saying, no, don't go in. The other thing about Asperger's is prediction. They can't follow through and predict what happens next. If they stay up all night, um, they can't predict that they've got to go to school the next morning and they have all sorts of sensory under you know over sensitive and this is what you're basically looking for um, and of course my youngest one's got attention deficit disorder this is what I've got and the only way I can describe is that's flit 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 so when you think of all these issues together um, if they were just using like, the normal autistic, this is why he didn't pass his... Well, he did pass it. He passed a BTEC level three, uh, sorry. Um, and, and what had happened was that he only got three merits. He needed six to get into the next course because he hadn't been taught by the, the correct PDA strategies. Had those PDA strategies been in the first place, we would have been able to, to get him through. He would have he failed four out of five exams because one that totally ignored me, refused to put the support in. Um, and then after that, they still wouldn't put the support in. And then eventually, because I told them about the sleep deprivation, what had happened then is that this that the sleep had gone off scale. And to me, that is mental cruelty, doing that to a child. It's just unbelievable. The other one was denied an education because he was bullied out of school. And it's just been absolutely horrendous. So had the both had the right strategies, one wouldn't have had the issues all the way through. And then, um, you know, sort of from there, it's, it's not going to go away. It's never, ever going to get better. It never will do. You, you, there's no cure for it. Um, and we're going to have to put these strategies in. If something happens to me today, you know, that the, they're just going to lose it. They're just going to go chung again. You know, it's just like a... Well, the, anxiety will go, go that, that, far, that, that the, the calm cope. Once you put the right strategies in, but the amount of people who don't know about PDA and the amount of for parents who come on this forum, including now there's a lot more women coming on saying that, you know, abuse... Um, you know, from sort of husbands and things like that. Um, there were, there's one parent, there's, I'm helping them all over the country, um, there's one parent who's got sort of four, and it's just absolutely horrendous, you know, sort of getting support. I'm just conscious of time. Now, yeah. that, I mean, I think that um, I want to check whether there's any other questions from the committee. I mean, I appreciate everything that you've said so far. Can I check? I just want to support uh -huh. You refer to music and art, and I have a deep interest in that. Is that probably the most prominent therapy you find for your children? The other one's into engineering and, you know, science and things like that. But music is, helps so many children on the spectrum. All right, out of those two I said, and, and yes. engineering, is music the top? For him it is, yes. Right. For my daughter it's let's swimming. Horse, I do a lot of horse therapy. Activity. We go swimming. Yeah. Music does help, she's quite musical. Every, every child is unique in PDA. They're all different. They're, it's like a fingerprint. No two are for the one same. might not work no. for the other one. It just it, depends. And it's like the strategies that could work the first day. You try them the next day and no it, yeah. means no. It doesn't matter think, what you do. I think that, you know, the point about music and a particular example is what can be achieved yeah. when the appropriate therapies are applied in individual cases. Um, here is a, a young man who's had a very difficult educational experience but is now flourishing 
because there is an understanding of his condition. And that's the tragedy of the situation. Until the syndrome is recognized, there will be endless cases of people uh, who could have achieved so much, who yeah. might have done so much, uh, and are not able to do so. Very conscious of time now. Of course, if there are further things that you want to feed into the committee as we go on, you know, obviously we'd be keen to hear from you. But I think the most compelling thing you've said is actually pretty basic, which is to get recognition of the syndrome itself. So I wonder if committee members um, want to consider what actions we could now take as a consequence of what we've heard today. I can get the Scottish um, Government's views on this uh, 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 and uh, see what actions are called for in this petition from them. Okay, would that be agreed? We should yes, ask the yes, Scottish Government. Yeah. Um, other organisations? Well, I think, I think you know, it's already been mentioned, the National Autistic Society. I, mean, I, 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 haven't, I actually coached somebody with autism in track and field athletics and uh, can see the impact that, that having a different, a different route can have. Um, I, would, I would like to, to, to understand the National Autistic Society's um, you know, view, views on this. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I, I basically, do they recognise it as a syndrome? I think that, that's something I would really so like. So Scottish Autism Organisations as well. Yeah. Um, we have here suggestions, Inquire, Child Autism UK, the Royal College of Paediatrics and Child Health, which would be interested to know what their view is, um, COSLA and perhaps teaching unions as well. In terms of the information that teachers and practitioners have. Bodies as possible. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and we... Sorry, Angus. Thanks, Camille. I was just going to say, following on from uh, Brian Whittle's comments, um, I think if it's possible, uh, if we are writing to COSLA, is it possible to get... Um, uh, you know, I think it was Mary Black that mentioned that uh, some councils do recognise uh, PDA and other councils don't, so if it was possible to get a list of which ones do recognise it and which ones don't, uh, give, it a, give it proper recognition. OK, so we're agreeing to write to Scottish Government, the, the organisations as we've identified, but this information about the, perhaps the difference from one local authority to another would also be an area that we could explore. Um, and I, if that's agreeable, I just want to thank our witnesses very much. I think um, if your first aim was to raise awareness of the condition, you've certainly done that. And I think we hear very strongly there are things that, draw, are, that come as a consequence of getting that recognition, which are very important in terms of um, helping families and individuals who are in, in these circumstances. So can I thank you very much for attending, and can we suspend the meeting for the changeover of witnesses?
to order. Um, can I? Um, we are now going to move on to deal with petition 1627, which is on the consent for mental health treatment for people under 18 years of age. Um, I'd like to welcome the petitioner, Annette McKenzie, to our meeting this morning. I think she too has had some challenges getting here, so we really appreciate that you have been able to come along. Annette has brought her petition forward following the death of her daughter, Brittany, who very sadly overdosed on medication that she'd been prescribed. As explained in the petition, Annette has brought this issue to us to try and ensure that no more parents have to go through what she has in recent months. Um, and we, we do recognise just um, how difficult that must have been for you. Um, if you're happy to do so, we would like you to make a short opening statement for approximately five minutes. Um, and after your statement, members will have some questions which will help us to decide what action we may wish to take in response to your petition. So if you want to say a few words, Annette. I think I covered most of what I wanted to say actually in the original petition. But first of all, I would like you to know that I'm not here as a witch hunt against one doctor in particular that prescribed my doctor this. When this happened with Brittany, yes, I was devastated, I was broken. But it also let me find a fault I find in the system where it's letting young people down, where we're increasing the rate of suicide with giving children with mental health problems medication. My daughter didn't understand at 16 years old the severity, the strongness and the medication she was given. She didn't understand. She went to the doctor that day to ask for help. She didn't go expecting to be given pills. I know a lot of people have concerns that my petition in particular will disencourage young children from going to seek help from their doctor. But as me as an adult, if I go to the doctor, I don't go to the doctor asking him for tablets. I go for a diagnosis on what he does. So as a child, to say that a child won't go to the doctor to ask for help, I don't believe that. Because the child at that age doesn't go to a doctor to ask for pills. They're going to speak out to ask to be helped. I just feel that at 16, you're not adult enough. If you have mental health, to make that decision. If you've got mental health problems, you're not in a clear frame of mind. I don't believe my daughter was in a clear frame of mind that day when she attended her doctors. I don't believe in 15 minutes appointment that GP was be able to assess my daughter, medicate her. She could have been having a bad day that day. I think more needs to be done for mental health. When you're 16, 17, there's loads of adolescents. You're going through, you're going through a lot of changes. You learn how to cope in this big bad world that we're living in. At 18, I would say you're more capable of understanding, consenting, understanding as well the long terms of the effects of taking something that you're going to be taking. I honestly don't know what more I can say to you that I haven't said in the petition. I strongly believe as a parent, I don't, I have another daughter who's 14, I have a son that's nine. I sit every day at home and I worry because my daughter is 14. She can go to the local GP. She can say she's depressed. She can say she's not sleeping at night. That GP doesn't need to contact me. They can give her the same pills they gave my daughter. What if she's missing her sister and she decides to take all those pills? There's nothing I can do. Because as a parent, I don't have the right to know. We're not just talking about my daughter being 16 here. We're talking about there being no age of consent. Our children, your children, you go in at eight, yes, the doctor's going to ask you, bring your mummy or daddy with you. You go in at 13, the doctor's going to treat you. If they see, they think you can consent, you're clever enough, smart enough, you can understand. All that for a 15 appointment, I don't know how they can understand that. But if they deem you to be wise enough, then they'll send you away with medication at 13. It's not 16. When Brittany first passed, I was angry because I still thought at 16 she shouldn't have been given the medication. And when I looked into it a little bit more and I found out there was no age limit, then I started speaking to other people whose children were on these tablets. Then I started talking to older people that have been on these tablets from 14, 15. They're impaired mentally, what they can do now. 
because by the time they were given them at 13, 14, 15, 16, the time 18 came, they were dependent on them. They couldn't come off them, they needed them for everyday life. And it's, mental health has been brushed under the carpet for far too long. It's a stigma, a taboo, nobody talks about it. The kids need to know it's okay not to be okay. Sometimes as adults, we're not okay. We don't know why, we get up sometimes, we just, we don't know why we're not okay. With children, it's, it's like bullying, it's not spoke about, it's brushed under the carpet. It's something that we're moving forward into 2017, which is hard for me to say, because I'm still in 2016. I'll never come into 2017. But we need to move forward. Mental health isn't getting any better. The death toll isn't going down any. I read the SPICE report that's on my petition about the amount of deaths in 2015 alone between 10 to 19 year olds. And I was shocked to think that whether it was intent or unintentful. And to be honest, if somebody wants to commit suicide, yes, they'll do it. They will go ahead and do it if they really want to do it. When somebody takes medication, to commit suicide, a lot of times they're not trying to end their lives. They're trying to get help. They don't know what else to do. They're at the end of their tether. All I'm asking is we make it harder for the children to be able to just... They're not thinking right. They're too young. My daughter didn't think, just taking all those tablets, she wasn't going to wake back up. She, was, she wasn't going to be here. She thought she would probably go to the stomach, get a stomach pump, go to the hospital and... That was it. She didn't think what was going to happen happened to her. There was a law made on paracetamol. Why was that law made? Not because you couldn't overdose on paracetamol, but you made it harder so that it wasn't so convenient to walk in and buy all these paracetamol. All I'm asking is to make it a bit easier for the kids to try and get some help that doesn't involve medication. At 18, by the time you're at 18, if you're still in that physical state of mind where you need the medication, then by all means. But if you want to medicate a child that's under 18, if that child needs medication, then their parents need to know. My daughter's mood changed from day to day. I told my daughter off. She became lazy. She wouldn't get up and go to her work. And as a mother, I just thought she was being a lazy teenager. In my last weeks with my daughter, I spent horrible to say morning at her, telling her to stop being so lazy to get up and do things, get to work. I didn't know at the time she was on propanol that was slowing down her heart rate. She was on 120 milligrams a day. That, for a child of her age, her height, or never been on medication, I've an antibiotic twice in her whole life. It was... I needed to know so at home I could safeguard her. She'd already said how she felt. She wasn't trusted. That medication in the wrong hands was dangerous. Her hands were the wrong hands. And so many more children are getting it. My daughter's boyfriend went to a different doctor in a different practice. Three days after my daughter's death, he was handed a full prescription of anatriptyline. He went to the doctors three and a half weeks ago as he was having a hard time with the Christmas period coming up. He's seen a different doctor and the same surgery, not the same surgery as my daughter, his own surgery. He was given triazepine, which does say in the leaflet not to be given to a child under the age of 18, he is 17, not to be given to somebody with suicidal thoughts because it entices and induces suicidal thoughts and tendencies. He was also given 42 propanol. Now, to me, I was disgusted. This young boy's went in and he said he's scared for his safety. What he's going to do to himself and what he's going to do to others. They've gave him a very high antidepressant that induces the suicidal thoughts. They've also then gave him the same drug my daughter overdosed on. What if that young boy left that surgery that day and thought, well, this is how they cared about Brittany? Is this what they think about me? And just went, he had enough, the same amount. He had enough amount that Brittany took that night to go and take. What if he just thought and went and took those? So my argument isn't only with one doctor. Thank you. I think it's that it's a broader question. It's not specifically about one doctor, but what you've said raises, I think, a whole lot of questions. Can I first of all start by asking you, you 
Your petition explains that you would like a parent or guardian's consent to be obtained before a young person is prescribed medication to treat mental ill health. I wonder if you could say a wee bit more about when um, you think that your involvement should be, when, when, at what point is a parent involved? Is it the point where they refer themselves to the doctor, or is it the point where the doctor then describes to prescribe? Well, I think when they first go to the doctor, I think the doctor should be more encouraging to try and, first of all, with Brittany's case, the doctor didn't once ask Brittany to involve myself or another family member. That should be open. They should. A patient doesn't know when they go in. A young patient doesn't know that they can have a family member told. They don't know that. I think there needs to be more awareness for the young patient to know that, that we can have a trusted family member involved. I think when it comes into the medication is when the parents need to be involved. I think the child should still be allowed to have their private meetings and speak with the doctor, even after they're given the medication. They should still have the right to go in and still speak confidentially with their doctor. But anything regarding the medication, the parents have to know. Um, Angus McDonald. Okay, thanks. Um, morning, Annette. Uh, you've certainly put forward your views extremely well today, and also in the in the petition. Um, but following on from uh, uh, Joanne's question, could you explain a bit more about how you'd like the the consent or consultation to take place? For for example, would you envisage a doctor writing to uh, the parent or the guardian uh, to inform them of the treatment uh, and seeking their their consent? Or would you like to see parents and guardians invited to attend the consultation with the parent? I mean, I know well, you. Well, I think the way I don't think it would just be a phone call up to say I'm going to give your child X amount of pills. Are you okay with that? I think it would have to be the child, the doctor, and the parent sitting in the room together. It's at least at a young age. It needs to be all of these. It needs to be a unit. The parents need to be working with the doctors, unlike the doctors need to work with the parent. So I would say the parents have to be in that consultation when it comes to the medication. But I don't think they should have to be told everything. I think children still have a right to confidentiality, but it's just that they need to know the medication they're on and they need to know the reason they're on it. So at home, like, Say at home, if I knew Brittany had Papanahol, she wouldn't have been in control of those pills. To be one, I wouldn't have wanted her to have them. I would have tried alternative methods, but if she had to have them as a parent, I would have took control and I would have administered them to Brittany and gave them to... If a doctor had convinced me Brittany needed those pills, I would have gave them to her, but I would have been in control and given them. Because in a mental health state, she might wake up tomorrow and she feels happy. She might wake up tomorrow, she feels like she wants to take her own life. She doesn't know how she feels. But I think the parents need to be in the consultation. Ronan Mackay. Thank you. Hello, hello Annette. Um, it's, it's clear from your powerful and, and very moving evidence today what a devastating impact this, this issue has, has on families. I'm just wondering if there's any circumstances that you would consider it not to be appropriate for a family member to be informed about, you know, what what the young person was being given, and you know, I'm thinking maybe maybe if the doctor takes the judgment that the parent might not allow the child to take that medication, or that's is there anything? Why would any not allow the child to take medication that was going to benefit their mm -hmm. health? So if they're at the point where they actually need help, mm -hmm. then as I said, if the doctor had convinced me it was in Brittany's best interest to have this medication, mm -hmm. I wouldn't have disagreed. I would have mm -hmm. medicated Brittany. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. we trust our health. We trust them. I go to my doctor. I don't... Mm -hmm. I know people say, do you read the guidelines on inside the box? No, I never used to. I do now. Mm -hmm. I never used to. I just trust him. Yeah. When the doctor gave me that prescription, that was... It was mm -hmm. fine. Yeah. Have you heard any um, instances of... Um, doctors saying, or, or do you know if doctors say to, to children, do you mind if I tell your parents? Or, you know, or, or is that just, just not come up during the well, consultation? Well, I've spoke to a couple of young people who have said that they have been asked mm. once by a doctor if they could call in the parents. Mm -hmm. And they said no, but I, I think in that case the parents were called in anyway because mm. there was a risk to... 
So it's, it's pretty weight. much left up to the doctor to, yeah, to do. Yeah, and I, I don't think the doctors, not every doctor, God, my doctor's been my rock since I lost my daughter. My, do my doctor has been amazing. Mm -hmm. I cannot fault her. I'm not saying all doctors, I'm not saying doctors are bad. Mm -hmm. Maybe they're overworked. They've not got a lot of time to be dealing with so many people. And it's, they can't sit down. But doctors aren't trained in mental health mm -hmm. properly. They don't, for all that doctor knew that day, my daughter could have split up with her boyfriend, which she did. Mm. She split up with him two days before, mm. having a tiff with... She fell out with her best friend the day before that again. It's like, there was loads of things. He, they didn't know my daughter, so they went on their own judgement and the judgement of a 15-minute assessment on my daughter. And it was like, if you haven't got the time then to make a proper assessment and say to her, come back next week, here's seven days worth of tablets, come back in seven days. Not, here's 84 tablets and I'll see you in 28 days because I'm too busy, I've got too many people to see. And there was a message from my daughter to her friend when she'd come out the doctors, and the message had said the doctor didn't even care, just gave me pills. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, hi, good morning to you. Um, one person in your, in your petition commented that um, she was concerned that, they, that young people might be discouraged from seeking medical help um, if there is a requirement to obtain parent or guardian's consent. Do you think there's a risk that young people may not seek that help? Um, and if so, how could uh, the risk be approached so that you're more young, that, to make sure that young people actually were able to seek help? So when a young person first goes to the doctor, like if yourself goes to the doctor, you don't expect to go to be prescribed antidepressants or anti-anxiety tablets. When my daughter went to the doctor, I had, unfortunately, have all my daughter's messages of how she was feeling on that night in question and prior to that. Sorry, what were you saying there? Basically, um, would you feel that was a barrier to young people no, seeking help right, if, if, if they had no, to seek um, parents' consent? because when they consent. actually go to the doctor, they're not going looking for medication, they're going for an answer to something. Exactly. They're not going for, can I have, please have antidepressants, can I have anti-anxiety pills, can I have this? They're going to try and explain to the doctor, look, I've got something going on in my head at the moment and I don't know how to explain it to my mum or to anybody else. So I'm coming to you as a doctor because I put my trust in you that you'll basically make me better. That's the way the kids look at it. I'll go to the doctor, but I don't think she expected to go to the doctor and be given pills. The doctor report said she didn't feel like talking at that time. You've only just met her for 15 minutes. Try inviting her back in seven days' time. Try asking her if there's anybody she would like to bring with her. Is there another adult that she would feel comfortable speaking to? Which my daughter did say to the doctor, it was her learning direct worker that advised her to go to the doctor. So my do daughter had asked somebody else for advice on how approaching it and letting us know as a family what was wrong with her. The person had told her she first has to make sense of the matter herself and try and understand to make a GP appointment, which she did. Barrier then to, for, no. for, to getting consent. Right. Okay, thanks. No. Thanks, okay. uh, Brian Whittle. Yeah. Thank you, Annette, for coming in today and, and, and uh, for a very, very moving testimony. And can I say that, that mental health has become a much greater uh, recognised issue, thankfully, in, in Parliament. Um, and, and you've raised concerns about the strength of medication available to young people, and I've done a lot of campaigning and awareness raising since the submitting the, the petition. And I think the members know my views on this, but do you, do you think there's a, a trend towards using med medication to treat mental health and other alternative forms of treatment that you, would, you think should be explored with patients I primarily? Think, I think maybe it costs too much more. The young, the young person's health budget was not long cut. Why cut young person's health budget? You, it's like saying young people don't have mental health, yet mental health in young people is on the rise more than anything. Society today... I'd say puts that much pressure on children from even the ages of 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 to be brilliant, to be perfect, to fit this criteria. So mental health is just, I think it's on the rise. It's something that people don't feel like, say, I went to my doctor the other day, for instance, and I seen a different doctor. My doctor I've been seeing since July. She wasn't on and I've seen a different doctor, a locum. Now, obviously, I get quite upset when I go to the doctors. 
And his whole demeanour, his difference to me was, he didn't know my case, he didn't know anything. It was hard to explain. I forgot what you were saying. No, sorry, I, I, no it's medication I'm on, see off the doctor now. Now this is sort of a point, I'm now on medication off the doctor and this is what it does to me. I forget, sometimes, when I'm sitting speaking. We're looking at the, you know, your views on the trend towards medicating instead of, or, or perhaps looking at alternative I, forms of it, treatment. I asked, when I put the petition online, I thought it was going to get quite a backlash from the young people, kind of be right against it, you know, and I was quite surprised. The young people were a lot for it. I had a young girl called Zoe, she stays in Spain. She's from Glasgow, she's a friend. She does blog writing. She wrote a perfect example of why she didn't attend a doctor for her anxiety until she was 19. Because she was terrified from the age of 14. She knows she had anxiety from the age of about nine. She was terrified of going to the doctor to prescribe the magic pill. And she's wrote a brilliant piece about it. And it points and highlights out why she chose to wait until the age she did to go to the doctor. And when she finally did go to the doctor, and expressed her concerns. Her doctor was brilliant. Said he would never medicate to a child under 18 anyway, those kind of high drugs. Now, we're not talking 10 milligrams they're giving these children. We're talking tablets of 40 milligrams, and they're high. They're not low, it's not a low dose, it's a high dose. And you're walking away with 84 tablets. That was enough to, for Brittany. Brittany's friend and Brittany's other friend, another friend if they wanted, that would have been enough for four of them to commit suicide if they wanted. And is suicide becoming a new trend as well? Or am I noticing it more? Because since my daughter passed, the amount of suicides of people taking their own life. Even had a case the other day, was it last week? I looked on Facebook and there's a young girl being shared, streaming a live Facebook of her death. It's becoming, suicide's an easy option these days and people will if they want to take their own life they'll take it but these kids that are getting prescribed prescription medication their heads are messed up and they don't know why so see when they're taking that medication they don't understand how strong it is my daughter didn't understand why would she google if the medication could, was going to kill her after she took it she didn't understand she didn't leave that surgery that day knowing that one side effects, I noticed. I wasn't privy to know, to notice them then. I just thought she was lazy. I noticed them now. She didn't understand if she took 38 of those tablets, she wouldn't be here. I think, honestly, my daughter thought if she took those tablets, she'd went to the doctor, she'd asked for help. I feel she felt she got no help apart from just giving pills, which wasn't a help. So the next step was to take those pills 16 days later the doctor had gave her. Now one, I don't know if the, that medication made her feel any different within herself, her thoughts, her feelings. It does say not to be given to somebody with depression. So that's a whole different matter with the General Medical Council. But the medication's too strong for them. I spoke to adults that were on the dose of preparing all my daughter was on one woman had it for postnatal depression. She was to take one tablet three times a day of 40 milligrams. She told me she could only manage to take, at the most, two of those tablets per day because the dosage was so high. She had mental problems prior to postnatal depression. She was 45 years old. My daughter was 16 years old, no mental history of health. Normal, every day, the cold or whatever. That was it. So why? The doctors use their discretion. Yeah, some doctors are brilliant, they're amazing. I can't say all doctors are the same. But the, the ones, one death is too many. And my daughter's death isn't the only death. Maybe I'm the only one sitting here talking about it, but hers isn't the only death that has been given prescription medication and not been told about it. Now, if I had known Brittany had medication, I could have safeguarded that medication. I would have been aware. I would have been more vigilant at home. I would have understood more when I asked Brittany the simplest thing is to go to the shop for me, which was across the road, 
and she didn't want to go out the door and go to the shop and I'm like, you're so lazy, please go to the shop. I've got your brother and sister, could you please go? And to her, that was a big thing, even to go out to the shop because of the way she was feeling. I didn't know that. I just thought she was being lazy and didn't want to go over to the shop. She was too busy in her room on her phone and it's... I treated her different than what I would have treated her. There's no distinction between mental and physical health. I could have seen if she was physically unwell. I couldn't say she was mentally unwell. So for there to be no distinction between the two of them, I think also is a bit of a concern. Somebody can hide mental health. If some, how do we know nobody in this room's got mental health? What does somebody with mental health look like? My daughter, she was absolutely beautiful. The countless people that say to me, why would your daughter do what she done? And it's like, what does somebody like with mental health look like? There's no answer what somebody with mental health looks like. But we do need to do something about it before, well, I would say before it's too late for me, it is too late. But not for my other children I've got and not for other families of other children. Thank you very much for that, Annette. I think we've, sadly, we've constrained with time, not because no, we want to, but simply because once the Chamber's business starts, we're no longer allowed to continue. So that would be the only reason that we would have to... Well, that's fair. Um, I, I think you, you have used me. the time that you've got very powerfully, I think, to give us a very clear measure of a range of challenges, I think, that are in there, round issues that you've highlighted. And I think other families will, of course, to thank you. I know it, doesn't, it won't be any comfort to you at all, but I think there are really important issues there that we need to consider further. And I wonder if we can think this is not going to be something we'll deal with very um, just in a rush, I don't think. I think there's a lot of thinking to be done about this, but I wonder if there are specific suggestions of what we might do um, immediately as a consequence of this petition. Well, I think, you know, what, as we all know, mental health has been uh, has much more prevalence in uh, parliamentary time um, these days, uh, especially now that we, we have a minister, even have a mental health minister. And I think that what, what um, Annette has brought here is, is consideration of something I never thought of in this, and it's brought something else into the debate, which I think, you know, I have to thank you very much for, much for doing that. I would, um, personally, I would like to, to uh, write to the Health and Sport Committee or, or, or to the Health Minister to find out where their thoughts are on this and find out where the, uh, the current legislation lies uh, in this particular issue. You know. And there was a report to the House of Commons, I think it was the House of Commons, House of Lords Committee, which talked about at least saying to the person that they were being consulted, I read that on the is it all right if we speak to your family? And their evidence was that most people would say yes. So that might be something um, that we can reflect on. But I think if we write to the Scottish Government asking their views, perhaps the Scottish Association of Mental Health, the Youth Parliament would have a view, I think, the Children and Young People's Commissioner, um, the Mental Health Foundation, the General Medical Council seeking their views in the position. I am interested too in knowing what the guidelines are for prescription to under 18s yeah. because I think probably what's surprising here, my sense is that there is a reluctance to prescribe even antibiotics. So is there a, a thing about under 18s you wouldn't prescribe or only in set circumstances? And I think we'd be interested to know what the, the clinical view in that would be as, as, as well. Um, I don't know if there's anything else that people might suggest. I think it's absolutely right. I think it'd be interesting to find out, you know, if, if there are, are the guidelines, which mean they're open to interpretation between different doctors, should there be more than guidelines and it should be mandatory that, you know, certain steps are taken so that to avoid situations like this. So that would all come out from the evidence that we take from the various... To the people that do the guidelines, is that MRH... So that's some of the regulations of the medication. I think the actual body for that. One of the other bodies might be the Royal College of GPs because they must have a view on what their guidance mm -hmm. is um, in these circumstances. But I know certainly for the medication my daughter was on, there was no guidelines. Okay. These are, th are th things I think that we'd want to go into. Uh -huh. This is a, a, an initial... Um, um, stage of getting these organisations and the Scottish Government to reflect specifically on what your petition calls for, which is specifically around consent, but there's no doubt there are other issues around that, that that are emerging as well. Um, and if that's agreed, 
we can um, we agree to these actions. We'll of course keep in touch with you, Annette, about that. And if there's anything else you want to add, please you know don't hesitate to contact uh, the clerks or myself, and we can pursue those questions. But for the moment, can I thank you very much for your attendance, and I'll suspend just for a moment. Thank you.